And it's my privilege to welcome everyone to the Summit on Ocean Biodiversity. We are so excited to have this distinguished group of leaders all together in one room. It's long been a hope for some of us, and it's becoming real today, which is truly humbling, um, that you've all made time in your days to come here and spend this, this time with us. We face so many challenges as a global society, challenges that are complex and all happening together, yet we often address them piecemeal. We know that biodiversity, the world's living species and habitats, are at the heart of human health, our well-being, our prosperity, because these living ecosystems provide our food and medicine, support a favorable climate, and are central to our history and our cultures. But the degradation of nature is accelerating in the face of climate change and human activities, and it's closely intertwined with social inequity and our security. Leaders at this summit today recognize this, and that's why you're here. How do we move forward considering all of these topics together? Fortunately, we have strong foundations for understanding the natural world in formal science, traditional knowledge, art, history, culture. These foundations and the work that many of you do are vigorous at the grassroots level, with organizations in this room leading the way. But what we need now is leadership at the highest level to coordinate across these efforts, build on them, invest in them toward new and more integrated approaches to sustain the living ocean and the human communities that depend on it to sustain all of us and our future generations. I failed to introduce myself. I'm Gabrielle Canonico from NOAA. Um, I am just so honored to be here today with all of you, and I'm going to give the uh, pass the mic to my colleague Emmett Duffy from Smithsonian. I'd like to welcome everyone also. Um, really exciting to have uh, this group here today. Um, I don't need to educate you about what the ocean does in our lives. I think everyone in this room knows how important it is to the economy, to our well-being, and everything else, as Gabrielle just mentioned. Um, but those services are degrading uh, in the face of climate change and many other impacts. Um, and frontline communities are, are feeling this more strongly than anyone else. Uh, we'll be having some discussion of that today. Um, just to uh, add to Gabrielle's message, the reason that we've brought such a diverse group here today is because we feel that we really need a whole of society approach to address, to address this issue. I think it came from a recognition that biodiversity is really at the heart of everything that's important to us, our food, economies, well-being, physical and mental, and so on. And uh, that, that's why we're here. So this is a historic moment. Um, we're convening to begin tackling uh, those issues together. Uh, we're really excited to have you with us and looking forward to uh, the next steps after this summit, which we'll be talking about as well. Uh, the space in the room today is limited, as you know, um, and so we've filled it to capacity. We're very happy about that. We'd encourage you, uh, for those who are on social media, to share your perspectives uh, with the Ocean Biodiversity Summit hashtag. Um, and I'd like to start by thanking the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, which our host, is our host today, and inviting the museum's uh, SANT director, uh, of, uh, Dr. Kirk Johnson, uh, to welcome you to the museum. Thanks, Emmett, and welcome everybody to the Coral and W. Whitney Science Education Center at the Museum of Natural History. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Um, we feel the museum is a great platform for convening for this particular group in, in specific. And you're in a room that has lots of specimens. Over there are the cases that we uh, allow kids to pull the drawers. When you get bored with the seminar, slip around behind, pull a drawer or two. There's a lot of marine biodiversity right there next to you. 6,000 specimens in this room open to the public because biodiversity is a really hard thing to communicate effectively to the public. Um, we really appreciate the long-standing collaborations that this museum's had with a number of science agencies like NOAA, NASA, and USGS over the years. And this is the world's largest natural history museum. There's over 148 million objects in this building in our warehouses over in Suitland, Maryland. So we hold about um, probably 50 million objects from the oceans. It's one of the greatest uh, repositories of ocean life on the planet. 
And um, every year we have scientists from around the world visiting, about 12,000 scientists visit here. Typically year, our scientists describe about 300 new species. Probably a third of those are marine species. So we're cranking out the biodiversity of the space. Most recently, we acquired the skeleton of Rice's whale, the first um, large baleen whale described in a long time. It was published in 2021, a, a new whale species, a baleen from the Gulf of Mexico, an entirely American whale species. A skeleton is now part of this collection. So biodiversity continues to be discovered as it's being damaged. And we're really trying to think about how we communicate that to our four million plus visitors a year here at the museum. Um, we also are working closely with other large museums of the world, and over the next three days in Chicago, we're meeting with the directors of the thir of 13 largest museums, natural history museums in the world, to imagine how we can take this uh, asset, the natural history museums, and make it a global asset and an interconnected global asset. We're um, thinking about ways of tying the genomic revolution and, and the digital revolution, the isotopic resolution to our collections. And you'll hear more about that with our ocean DNA project um, that's happening here. This is all part of the Smithsonian's life in a sustainable future effort and its ocean strategy. So welcome to the museum. I'm as eager as you are to hear what people have to say and have a great time today. Thanks very much. You're going to feel very welcomed by the time we're done. Um, I'm Ellen Stofan, the Undersecretary for Science and Research. And I can't tell you how excited Sarah Kapnick from NOAA, who's going to be up next, and I are to welcome you to this summit. This has been a while in the making. We had an amazing initial workshop in August, and this is a follow-on to that. Nature is not an externality. Nature is critical, as you've heard to security, to food, to the very health of everything on this planet. We have to, as a scientific community, as a public policy community, as representatives from indigenous communities around the planet, we have to come together and say, how do we develop marine biodiversity indicators that can be used to assess the health of our oceans, the status of our oceans, what is happening to them. It's time to stop talking and to really get down to action because the planet demands it, we all demand it, our children and grandchildren demand it. I'm excited we have the right people in this room to really start moving this forward and coming up with actionable, actionable, actionable solutions to help us really assess marine biodiversity in a way that really helps move the oceans forward in terms of sustainability for all of us. So I am so excited to have you all here today. Um, and I am super pleased um, to uh, bring Sarah Kavnick from NOAA up to welcome you also. So I am Sarah Kapnick, NOAA Chief Scientist, with the final welcome <laughs> to say, a central theme of the summit is the major challenges society faces. Climate change, biodiversity loss, and lingering social inequality are all closely intertwined, and therefore we must have integrated solutions. This theme informs the expert panels that we've convened today to understand what are the necessary actions look like and how can we translate them from discussion into implementation? A critical piece of solving these challenges will be unlocking private capital for investment in biodiversity science and conservation. In order to attract these investments, it is imperative that we have evidence-based metrics and indicators necessary for monitoring, reporting, and verification to ensure that investments are delivering the desired outcomes. Without these, we will not be successful in ensuring sufficient funding is available to protect ocean biodiversity or accelerate ocean-based climate solutions. We need a coordinated national strategy for biodiversity stewardship and the science needed to do it effectively at the national scale. This is underway now. This type of strategy will ensure that we are intentional in our efforts to enhance and expand the nation's capacity and infrastructure for biodiversity science through public-private partnerships, intentional inclusion of traditional ecological knowledge, and by advancing new technologies like artificial intelligence and genomics to give a few examples. 
There's a lot of momentum putting a spotlight on biodiversity right now, including the launch of the Na National Nature Assessment and the goal of protecting 30% of global land and ocean by 2030. We know that the success of these efforts is contingent upon undertaking this work in an equitable and inclusive manner. We see an exciting opportunity for this summit to catalyze this action, and we look forward to engaging and inspiring further discussion. We are thrilled today to have Monica Medina here with us to speak in the larger context and the need for the strong US leadership in tackling these global challenges. Monica joined the Wildlife Conservation Society just last June as the organization's first president and CEO. Monica, prior to that, she served as the State Department Assistant Secretary for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs and was designated by the Secretary Anthony Blinken as the Special Envoy for Biodiversity and Water Resources. A lawyer by training, she has served in numerous roles across government and in civil society to advocate for the ocean and environmental health and security. Welcome, Monica. Hello, everybody. Gosh, what an honor it is to be in this room with so many ocean leaders and ocean champions. I have to first, of course, say hello to Jane Lubchenco, a mentor of mine, Andrew Steer, uh, Janie Bavicia, who will be here at some point, I'm sure, if she's not already here, um, Charlotte, Valerie, Shannon. There's so many people here who have worked so hard to bring us to this point. Um, so thank you, Sarah, for all you do now at NOAA, and, and to Rick and everyone at Team NOAA. You know, those of us who've been there know what a place, a wonderful place it is to work and how much you bring to this whole enterprise, this ecosystem of ocean advocates and ocean champions. Um, I am here, I think, basically to cheer you on um, and to get you started on a, on a positive note. And you know, I think I can use that wave analogy forever. The wave is growing. This is an ocean century in my view. And um, yet, the space is getting more crowded and our resources are going fast. We have, I think, seen an awful lot of new energy around things like the blue economy and, um, and, and around conservation. Uh, from the Global Biodiversity Framework and 30 by 30 and BBNJ. And let me take a minute to say, it was just this week, three years ago, I see Amy Kenny nodding because she knows what I'm going to say, that the president um, made the 30 by 30 commitment in oceans as well as on land. What an amazing thing to start an administration on that right foot right away. So here we are, and yet um, I'm going to... I'm going to, sorry, Jane, probably sort of use your line first. <laughs> the oceans are too big to ignore. The ocean is too big to ignore. And it's too big to let it fail. I know you'll say it again. But that's a, a line that I use a lot because it's so true. We depend on them. You all know this. But we have to explain that to people. And I think it is on us to try to build this movement, to build this wave, which is what I talk about a lot in my new job, taking all of the energy and enthusiasm that we have and trying to create a positive wave, which is why I love working now, having an aquarium that is part of the organization that I run, because we are working hard for things like a Hudson Canyon new marine monument out in the New York Bight that will help uh, conserve the Atlantic Ocean and, and sort of catch up to the West Coast on marine conservation. Um, and I do think, you know, the Global Biodiversity Framework, the 30 by 30 agreement that the whole world has made, and the new areas beyond, or uh, BBNJ, uh, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdictions Treaty, put a new focus on marine spatial planning on biodiversity in the ocean and on protection. And if, if I have three things to suggest to you, I would say they are, we have to lead with science. This is the ocean decade. Science is happening everywhere in a new way. We're exploring the ocean in ways that we never have before, but we have to stay wedded to that science. We have to lead with planning and with communities. And, and listen to them and help them figure out how do we do this work in the ocean to make sure that it is 
it is there for all of us, for not just for today, not for all the uses like wind, a new, uh, a new space constraint in, in coastal oceans, or the shipping challenge that is, I think, a constant because the ocean is the biggest mode of transportation in the, in, on the planet. Um, so we have to think about planning, we have to think about communities, and we have to get to 30% in the U.S. and do it now. Um, I, you know, would be remiss if I didn't spend a li at least a minute talking about the Pacific Remote Islands uh, new um, uh, uh, marine sanctuaries proposal that I know NOAA is working so hard to get done um, with the communities. It's an indigenous-led one. It's wonderful. And to get the full extent of the Pacific Remote Islands um, territory within a management protection scheme would just be fantastic. And it would get the U.S. to 30 percent, which is so important. When I think about what I did in the State Department and with a team of people, we worked very hard to get other countries to agree to that 30 percent number. And if the U.S. was already there, that would be fantastic. So I think these are the three most important things, and that's why this national strategy for ocean biodiversity is so important because it lays the foundation for all of this. And so the last thing to leave you with is that there are lots of meetings coming up. The UN Ocean uh, Conference and de the Decade uh, meeting in Barcelona, the Our Ocean Conference in Greece, the CHOW, the International Marine Conservation Conference in South Africa in October, the Biodiversity COP, the Climate COP, there, the Plastic Agreement, for goodness sakes. There are so many opportunities to advance ocean conservation. It's a global challenge. There are so many other countries that are really excited about doing this work with the United States. And um, so I'll just end with something that I heard Al Gore say again last week at a bunch of meetings in Europe. He said, that political will is a renewable resource. And I'll just modify it for the ocean context to say that ocean conservation wave is a renewable resource. Let's go. Let's take this big wave as far as we can. We all love the ocean. And we love people who love the ocean. So let's take that love and build a great, big, wonderful ocean uh, biodiversity strategy because the ocean needs us. Thank you very much for letting me be a part of this. Thank you, Monica. You're an inspiration, and I'm so grateful to you for traveling to be with us today um, and for sharing those perspectives, which will help us think about the motivation for our work together in a much larger, very much a global context. The charge is very big, but we, we are equipped um, it's my pleasure now to introduce the next session, a fireside chat between two leaders which we've been looking forward to and which is sure to inspire further thought and discussion. Just brief introductions. Jane Lipchenko is in her fourth year as the Deputy Director for Climate and Environment at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. There she leads a team that uses knowledge and innovation to help achieve America's aspirations of a healthy environment stable climate, and prosperous, equitable, secure communities. Jane is a marine biologist and environmental science, scientist with leadership experience in academia, civil society, philanthropy, government. She has served on the National Science Board, the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum Board, as Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and NOAA Administrator, and as the inaugural State Department's Science Envoy for the Ocean. She is on loan to the White House from Oregon State University. Dr. Andrew Steer is the President and CEO of the Bezos Earth Fund. Andrew joined the Earth Fund from the World Resources Institute, where he served as President and CEO for over eight years. Prior to this, he served as the World Bank's Special Envoy for Climate Change and as Director General at the UK Department of International Development. This followed 10 years in East Asia, where he was head of the World Bank in Vietnam and Indonesia. His appointments also include experience in a variety of organizations, including the World Economic Forum, the Energy Transitions Commission, the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, and the Asian Development Bank, among others. 
We will have some time for questions and discussion after Andrew and Jean share their thoughts about the summit and the work ahead. But right now, I would like to turn this over to them, and we have chairs for you. Hi, everybody. Hello. Are you out there? Hello, hello. Thank you, Gabrielle. Really, really appreciate that introduction. Um, boy, what uh, an exciting event we have planned today. I'm just thrilled this is finally happening. Uh, and it couldn't be happening at a cooler place than Curious at the Natural History Museum. Uh, I was telling Kirk as I walked in, it sort of brought back memories of the first time I brought my grandkids here in 2019. And uh, they would just had so much fun pulling out all the drawers, as Kirk said, and exploring and just getting into stuff. And it was just really, really fun. So thank you, uh, Kirk uh, and uh, team uh, Ellen for enabling us to be here. Thank you to uh, our NOAA colleagues uh, for uh, the really collaborative work that you guys have led to bring us to this point. Uh, we are just thrilled to have an opportunity to chat, and it is a pleasure to be here uh, with my colleague, uh, Dr. Andrew Steer. Um, what we have planned for you um, is the following. Uh, we would like to uh, spend, uh, do a little bit of uh, opening remarks that each of us would like to do, uh, and then uh, we're gonna ask each other some questions, uh, and then we're gonna open it up to all of you. So that's sort of the format of what we're gonna do. I think we have the wonderful advantage of having a really diverse group of folks here in the room. You come from lots of different uh, places and different ways of thinking about the ocean. But we are, I think, all unified uh, in uh, the, our excitement about uh, ocean biodiversity and the understanding that is really connected to so many things that we care about in ways that not everybody else in the world always understands but that is an opportunity. Um, what I'd like to do is open with a story about Andrew <laughs> that relates directly to what we're talking about. So um, about seven years ago, uh, Andrew, in his previous role as president and CEO of um, the... Uh, World, I always say WRI, World Resources Institute, <laughs> um, was convening a, a group, an international group of ocean leaders who uh, had pledged to work together to try to create some new momentum, some new actions, some new policies uh, as government leaders. These were presidents and prime ministers, heads of state and government, who were really interested in uh, implementing some bold, uh, new uh, transformations in the ocean. And at one of their very first meetings, Andrew, uh, who was always three steps ahead of everybody else, was saying to the group, not only do you need to think about uh, the policies and the champions and the actions that are needed, but he challenged them to think about crafting a new narrative for the ocean that the existing narratives that were out there really weren't appropriate for the challenges ahead or the solutions ahead. Uh, and he uh, essentially challenged them. And he looked across a number of different other international global efforts that had been successful and ones that hadn't. And he said, one of the key elements of success is to have a good narrative. And the ocean doesn't have a good narrative. So that was a challenge to this group. I think most of them didn't quite know what to think about that. Uh, but I took that challenge to heart and really thought uh, over the next uh, year or so, what should a narrative for the ocean be? Now, Monica has already uh, tipped my hand uh, because uh, I think this is uh, a narrative that, that uh, has now uh, gaining a lot of um, enthusiasm and support. Um, and the, the narrative really goes to the heart of why we are here today. The narrative says that for the 
vast majority of human history on this planet, people have thought about the ocean as being limitless, endlessly bountiful, endlessly resilient. We could take whatever we want, dump whatever we want, and it didn't matter. Uh, and we've seen in no uncertain terms that that's not true, although I will say some people still think it is and some people still act as though it is, and that's a problem. But a new, and, and so the, the initial uh, narrative that many people had about the ocean was that it was too big to fail. We just, it, it, it didn't matter what we did. It was so big, it didn't matter. The narrative that uh, has taken hold in many places around the world focuses on the fact that we have so many problems in the ocean today, from overfishing to bleaching coral reefs to plastic pollution, you name it, and there is a major problem that's really, really hard to fix. And so uh, a new narrative that has taken hold is that the ocean is too big to fix. The problems are too, in t uh, the, the problems are just too complicated, the vested interests are too powerful, there's no way we can do all of those things together. The new narrative that is beginning to emerge based on science, based on the work of so many of you in the room, is that in fact the ocean is so central, so key to what we want to achieve, what we need to achieve, that it's too big to ignore. That the ocean is central to solving climate change. The ocean is central to equity issues. The ocean is central to human health. It's central to national security. It's central to a vibrant economy. And so all of those things come together in a very integrated fashion in this new narrative for the ocean. It's not too big to fail. It's not too big to fix. But it is too central and too important to ignore. So, Andrew, uh, credit to that narrative goes to you. Uh, and I think it really goes to the heart of what Ellen challenged us to do, which was to stop talking and start acting. And what Sarah challenged us to do, which was to integrate how we are thinking about these issues in very practical ways. And much of what we are doing in the Biden-Harris administration is exactly that. We are trying, we are acting, we are acting uh, with uh, excitement, passion, science, uh, and we are um, integrating across so many different areas. We will touch on many of the things that we are doing in the context of our conversation, uh, but I want to uh, give Andrew a chance to make some opening remarks, and then we'll dive into a bit of a conversation between the two of us. So, Andrew? Great. Over Thank to you. you. Thank you, Jane, who um, always exaggerates in a very, very nice way. So thank you, thank you. Um, I am nervous sitting alongside the mighty uh, James Lubchenco. So um, thank you for what you did. The, the, the true part of that story, actually, just to rewrite it a little bit, this is actually the, the Our Ocean Conference in Malta. Actually, Prince Charles, the then Prince Charles, was chairing the meeting, had the good and the great there. And we made this point, and that led to the high-level um, um, commission on the ocean economy. The intellectual driver of the whole process was Jane Lubchenco. And it's really thrilling to see heads of state, because it was only a head of state you know, exercise, sort of uh, really embrace the narrative that, that Jane came up to. Let me say what a, a joy it is to be here and to thank those of you in this room. Um, I do believe, as um, uh, Ellen and, and Monica and Jane and others have said, I do believe that we have a, a truly historic opening now. Um, and that doesn't happen just by chance. It happens because an enormous amount of analysis and work and research in the vineyards <laughs> below the sea have been going on and people in this room have led it. And we now are at a stage where actually there is a rising recognition of the importance and, uh, of the ocean. And it is incredibly important that we seize this smartly. Um, I'm old enough to have uh, been at the original Rio Earth Summit, and, um, and following the Rio Earth Summit, I was then director of, uh, of environment and social policy for the World Bank. And following the Rio Earth Summit, in the 
succeeding five years or seven years or so, biodiversity was a much hotter topic than climate change. The World Bank was just, was just absolutely all guns blazing on biodiversity, believe it or not. And then what happened is actually we realized didn't really, um, we didn't really have a, a, a narrative linking this to economic development, which is what we're about. Um, and actually we weren't that good at it, <laughs> the World Bank, but it wasn't only us. Biodiversity then, sadly, fell off the agenda. We had an incredible window of opportunity. We thought we were seizing it, but we didn't, and we failed. And we probably lost 10 or 20 years, actually. It wasn't that work wasn't being done. People in this room were doing work, and now we are seeing the potential fruit of this but we need to seize it with real discipline at the political level, at the technical level, at the financial level, at the corporate level. And that's why this meeting is so cool. And if you look who's actually in this room, it's a very, very interesting group of people mixed from all the different, and that's why we are thrilled to be part of it. And we, we love working with the, uh, with the Smithsonian and with many other institutions here, just to let you know about the Bezos Earth Fund, Jeff Bezos, very kindly, um, set $10 billion assigned, aside to be given as grants this decisive decade. He says, I don't want to set up a foundation that will last 100 years. I want to make sure that we seize this window of opportunity. And it aims at two things, nature and climate, which of course are massively related. And in nature, our first sort of foray has been to announce $3 billion, $1 billion to conserve what we still have, one billion to restore what we have lost, and one billion to rethink food systems without which you can't conserve and you can't restore. So that's sort of where we are, and for us, the marine side of things is just as important as the um, terrestrial side of things. And we are all in on the 30 by 30. We are absolutely thrilled to have been sort of engaged with many of you in the lead up to the decision last year. We were financing a lot of the outreach and the political sort of how do we, how do we go from 50 countries to 110 countries and then universal acclamation. I mean, what an incredible joy that was up in Montreal. Um, and then also, I mean, people in this room, Monica and many others, uh, have, were very much part also of the high seas, and you were too, Jane. Um, and uh, to, to see that breakthrough in the high seas. And just last week, I mean, interestingly, show how the world sort of shifts. Monica and I at, at Davos were together on, um, uh, on a panel with the good and the great um, on the high seas treaty. And what will it take? Uh, to not only get the 60 countries, there, there are now two that have, um, that have actually ratified it, how to get the six countries by this time next year, um, but in addition to that, how do we actually implement something which is profoundly exciting but also profoundly complicated. So let's get at it. I'm going to ask you the first question, Jane, because um, you actually know about this topic. Um, it, it, you know, it's very easy to, to feel depressed about the state of the ocean. Um, we, we've, we've all seen the data. How do you hold the reality of how bad it is and also recognize the only way forward is to have hope and inspiration? And how also do we move from a technocratic top-down approach to things to an inclusive approach where we, where we bring in the communities without which we will surely fail? Thank you, Andrew. Those are absolutely right at the heart of, I think, our collective challenges. Uh, those of us who are out on the water often uh, see in real time not only some of the impacts that climate change, ocean acidification, uh, pollution, overfishing are having uh, on the ocean. Um, and it is all too easy to um, feel like we're not making progress fast enough. Uh, but in truth, if you go around to different places in the world, you see amazing things bubbling up all over the place. There are uh, very creative solutions that are underway. They just are not at the pace and scale of change that is needed. Uh, and so part of the challenges to governments uh, and to the private sector uh, and to philanthropy is to 
elevate and accelerate those solutions and make them happen faster and at scale. And that's exactly what we are trying to do uh, within the Biden-Harris administration, for example, uh, is to uh, leverage the great stuff that's underway in a lot of our agencies and, and through our agencies to a lot of different communities and identify those kernels, uh, those insights where communities have come up with very clever ways of dealing, uh, of, of restoring, protecting, restoring uh, their habitats, for example, and how to scale those up. At the same time, we do need uh, governments taking action and setting those targets and changing the incentives uh, and philanthropies providing uh, resources, but also directed uh, in, in ways that incentivize action. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, climate despair uh, that's very real, uh, and I think that some of the antidotes to that are providing opportunities for engagement providing inclusive tables where people can gather, uh, providing communities that can come together, communities of young people, communities uh, of, uh, of, of, you know, communities of people. Uh, and again, around the world we are seeing lots and lots of action in that space. Uh, so there is, uh, it, it is not hopeless. Uh, you know, we know that many of these Biogeophysical systems are as nonlinear as, uh, or many social systems are as nonlinear as many of our biogeophysical systems. And what we need to do is get to these tipping points where things can happen very, very rapidly. And I think that that's part of uh, what we are seeing underway. Um, we uh, just released an ocean justice strategy uh, at the Climate COP. And that, I think, is one highlight of, uh, of an, an, a commitment to inclusivity, uh, a commitment to equity uh, and environmental justice in the ocean space. And I invite you to take a look at that uh, as we create larger tables, as people who are affected are at the table, not disenfranchised. And that opportunity to engage, to act, to be part of the decision making is really critical. Um, speaking of big funding commitments and bringing communities to the table, Andrew, um, you made a big announcement uh, at COP28. Uh, I would like to hear about it. Well, what we, we look for um, in making um, grants is uh, we look for leadership that is willing to take risks, work together. Um, and, and we feel, because we're blessed with generous uh, financial resources, we feel we need to make every, every dollar that we give away sort of do two things. First, it has to deliver whatever it is the grantee says they're going to deliver. But second, it has to be part of a broader sort of momentum building to create a movement for change. And so, um, at, as, you, as you may know, at COP26, uh, the Pacific Island, uh, countries um, announced that they would work together um, to commit to 30 by 30, um, and that would imply the largest um, uh, protected area, uh, protected area network in the history of the world by far, you know, four times the size of the United States. And um, uh, just two years earlier, I mean, the, the, the sort of the history and how big decisions are made and how, how pol politicians think is illustrated by, in COP26, you may remember, that the Eastern Pacific, or, uh, Eastern Pacific countries, Ecuador, Colombia, Costa Rica, Panama, those four countries at the head of state level went to uh, COP26 and they said, we are going to create the largest transnational marine protected area ever. And, and we all, you all probably were there meeting with them. We were thrilled. Within six months, I mean, not only had we all, and there are people in this room that were very central to that, not only had we sat with all of these governments and with local communities, we had been part of a financing plan and we were able to press the start button. And the fascinating thing about the Eastern Tropical Pacific uh, is that of those four countries, Three of them now have totally different governments, totally different parties, and they do not love the previous governments in many instances, but all of them 
are absolutely committed to move ahead, and we heard that again last week. Fascinating. Why? Because it was designed in a way that people and citizens realized it was in their interest, and even fishing communities realized it was in their interest. So what's that got to do with the, East, with the Central and Western Pacific? Those countries, we and many others, and they came, the, the, the Pacific Island leaders came down here, met with President Biden a few months ago. We had a, a terrific meeting um, with, with them, with many of you there. Um, and they said, hey, that seemed to work for those guys <laughs> on the Eastern Pacific. Why don't we do the same kind of thing? And the question is, why does it matter that all 15, well, there are 16, we're still waiting for the 16th to come on board. There are various political reasons uh, related to deep sea mining, um, but let's not get into that. But 15 are committed to that. Why does it matter? Well, it matters for several reasons. One, common problems, sharing information, sharing scientific research, but m even more important, political soulmateness. Um, you know, there's a, almost every major revolution involves several nations that actually want to be part of something that's bigger and you get a rising. So we were able, we said, look, if you guys are serious about this, we're going to put $100 million of grants on the table right away. But, you know, it has to be professionally designed and uh, others financiers need to come in to make the whole package add up, and we're willing to finance, or we're very keen to finance basic research which needs to be done, but then all kinds of spatial planning, all kinds of community participation, all kinds of expenditures that you need in order to do what's required. And, and it's a pleasure to work with some of you here uh, in this room. So there's, you know, to see this kind of wave, as someone was saying, I can't remember whether it was Ellen or someone, wave of, of political, wow, these guys did it. We could do that too, we could be part, um, but none of it happens without the kind of research that is led by people in this room, and none of it will happen unless there is an economic narrative to go with it. Andrew, I think that economic narrative uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, and you mentioned earlier the Rio conference and how nature really was on the table, biodiversity was a thing. Um, and then it sort of fell off and climate took ascendance. Uh, and initially the uh, economic case for climate wasn't really there. Uh, it was more uh, a moral and ethical case and a scientific case. Uh, but that changed. Uh, and now we are seeing more the resurgence of a coupled nature times climate agenda. And I'd uh, invite you to reflect, if you would, on um, sort of how you think about nature with respect to the economy. What, what is that connection? How do you think about it, not only in your grant making, but uh, at, in, at a global sense? Well, it's absolutely critical. Um, now, we have to be careful, though, not to oversimplify it. Following the Rio Earth Summit, actually, there were lots of experiments, you, you, you may remember, where it was thought that drug companies would pay to protect the forests of Costa Rica because they were going to make so much money out of the drugs. And it sounded so perfect. You know, in other words, you put a monetary value on biodiversity, um, and why not? Um, and I confess, we were part of that. <laughs> we thought it was a great idea. It didn't work. It didn't work because actually um, the value of nature is much more than, than that. And back then, of course, they didn't have technologies that would enable them to prospect for new drugs quickly enough. So it sort of collapsed under its own weight. It was a good idea, but, but I think there's a lesson there, which is do not oversimplify here. I mean, one of the really nice things about our boss, Jeff Bezos, um, he says, look, first of all, I want everyone to know that we are in the business of supporting nature, not just because nature is related to climate change, and not just because nature is actually economically valuable, but because nature is intrinsically valuable, and nature is beautiful. I mean, it's, it's, it's really actually quite inspiring dealing with him on that. So we, we need to get the right balance, but we absolutely, as you say, Jane, we need a narrative. And one of the, one of the exciting things, some of you were involved in it, is watching those those ministers on the eastern tropical Pacific seascape sort of agonizing in discussion with their fishing industry 
and using modern research that some people in this room have been part of, people like Enrique Sala as well, showing that actually if you protect the right 30%, your fishing catch will go, can go up. It actually is good for you. And seeing that kind of conversation going on and hearing the Ecuadorian minister who, is, who, who stood up in, in Montreal, the, the minister of environment, next to the minister of fisheries, and together they announced this protected area. So cool. And then the Colombians and the others learned from that. And so you see that kind of story. And, and one of the really nice things about this um, uh, the Central and Western Pacific story now is that they've got, that they, they, they have a, a threefold strategy. One, protect. Two, invest in the coastal economies and build those ligatures between the protection and that. And third, sustainable finance. And it's terribly important and we need, and Jane, you led the charge on the high level panel on the ocean economy, the heads of state panel. And the reason we set that up is because we'd, we'd seen how well it worked on climate. 20 years ago or 10 years ago, everybody thought acting on climate would be a nice thing, but actually it will hurt your economy, you'll lose competitiveness, you'll lose jobs. So, you know, there's a trade-off. Modern 21st century economics shows you that smart climate action leads to more economic efficiency, it drives new technologies, it lowers risks, and it reshapes expectations. Those four things together actually lead to a more vibrant economy, and we need to show the same thing which you managed to do for the ocean. But how about you? You, you uh, bo both in your current job and, um, and NOAA, but then also in your academic work, um, the idea of sort of natural capital it's a terribly important idea, and you've thought about it a lot. How goes the battle on that? Um, I think part of what you're talking about, Andrew, is that success can breed success, that it's contagious. Uh, and we're seeing that happen across many different areas. Um, having the realization that, in fact, um, climate action, smart climate action, is good for the economy has really uh, inspired uh, President Biden uh, in this administration to have the most ambitious climate agenda ever. Uh, and that uh, is moving along at a very uh, rapid clip. Uh, it's exciting to be part of. Equally important is this connection between the climate agenda and nature and equity. And we see those as highly integrated. And to your specific question about um, natural capital, uh, it is absolutely true that the economy is fundamentally dependent on nature. We just don't have any way of tracking how nature is doing. And so it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. And based on the work of a lot of people, uh, we are in the process now of creating um, economic environmental uh, environmental economic statistics uh, and natural capital accounts, which are, in short, putting nature on the balance sheet, on the economic balance sheet. If it's not there, then uh, you don't track it, you don't know how it's changing, you don't know how it relates to other things that you care about, and so putting it on the balance sheet is critically important. And that's true across the board, but it's also true for the ocean. And the sustainable ocean economy uh, depends uh, in, uh, on many activities in the ocean. But having that accounting reflect not just the goods that we extract from nature, but the services that nature provides is vitally important. And so our natural capital accounts uh, are really uh, exciting a lot of people, uh, so much so that the US is working now together in partnership with Canada and Australia to c compare and contrast uh, what we are doing uh, and thinking about uh, how do we learn from each other, uh, how can we uh, move more rapidly uh, but carefully in, in this space. Uh, and in parallel to that, uh, the administration has been doing um, a lot of deep thinking about how do we modernize the regulations that drive a lot of what government does in ways that reflect the importance of uh, the benefits of nature, the so-called ecosystem services? 
And so the Office of Management and Budget that gives instructions to agencies about how to balance their decisions, how to do their benefit cost analysis, is now taking nature into account uh, in a much uh, more significant way than we have in the past. So a lot of really interesting and fun discussions underway in that space. Uh, and it's uh, not, you know, we didn't, GDP wasn't created uh, overnight. It took 10 years to figure out how to measure GDP. Well, the same thing is playing out in this space. It's going to, you know, we have a 15-year agenda to figure out how to do natural capital accounting. So it's really exciting, and the marine accounts are front and center in that space. Yeah, that's a brilliant analogy, actually. I mean, literally thousands of uh, top economists spent several decades um, uh, and uh, you know it started out very imperfect but as the years went by it became much better and, and we're now seeing that same thing um, let me ask you this um, we can't do everything all at once we have to set priorities how do you how do you go about that and who's responsible for what not everybody understands how the federal government works um, and how you, um, how you uh, sort of also do deals with the private sector. Tell us, what, what are the sort of exciting initiatives that are being thought through right now? <clears throat> well, it starts at the top. You know, leadership starts at the top. Uh, and the president really talks about, uh, we can define America with one word, possibilities. And he often says that uh, in, you know, with, with passion. And to him, Science is about possibilities, but possibilities create opportunities for people. And so, you know, his leadership is very much focused on using science, but delivering for people. And so this priority setting is seen through the lens of how can we uh, build on science, uh, on evidence, on knowledge, uh, not only from science, but from indigenous knowledge. How can we bring that together to address some of the biggest challenges of the day, but deliver for people? In the end, if people don't see that it's benefiting them, they're not going to support it. And, you know, the president is absolutely passionate about making a difference in people's lives in tangible ways that they can see. And so, Job creation, uh, it, you know, looms large, for example. Uh, economic benefit looms large. But those are connected directly to climate change and to uh, opportunities for uh, participating in um, the clean energy uh, revolution. Uh, so the American Climate Corps that was just recently announced as an opportunity for young people to get trained in skills that then enable them to participate in uh, clean energy development. Uh, so, you know, there are many of the big challenges. So climate looms large, equity looms large, nature looms large, and they are all interconnected in ways because they affect health, they affect um, national security, uh, and it is all connected. You just don't see all those connections all the time, if you will. <laughs> so we think about um, the importance of uh, bringing all this together. I see we have about uh, 10 minutes or so left before we have Q&A. Uh, so uh, I think we should uh, pivot, if you will, to maybe a couple of quick questions. Mm -hmm. Can I pose to you? OK, OK. So. Um, let's think about, um, let me get my head. So we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, what do you think are the most important things that we can collectively be doing? How do we take advantage of the diversity in this room? Um, how can, uh, beyond inviting all of you to contribute to the um, federal notice, uh, the, the invitation from the Federal Register notice to comment on the National Biodiversity, National Ocean Biodiversity Strategy, which I invite you all to do. It's open through the end of February. So please, please help us shape what that looks like. But beyond that immediate opportunity, what kinds of things do you see are opportunities for people in this room to 
take advantage of the time that we have together, keeping in mind the three themes of the summit, uh, to really move the needle on uh, ocean biodiversity. Mm. Wow. Um, change happens when different disciplines, different cultures, different backgrounds spark each other. Um, and what we need is some sort of game playing. In this room, there are some of the leading researchers in the world that have been working for year after year doing amazing work. And some people know about that work, others don't. Sitting at the next table or next to you might be somebody from the corporate sector. Is there any relationship whatsoever? Sitting next to you is someone that's leading an NGO that actually is very good at convening and consulting and lobbying and, and politic political advocating sort of thing. Anything there. And next to you is a media person. And what do they do? And then there's a philanthropist that actually, the great thing about being a philanthropist as opposed to a government agency is that you can put your money any way you like very quickly and you don't have to worry quite so much about, you know, what the newspaper might say about you um, or what the congressional committee might ask you to do. So sit next to a philanthropist and say, hey, you know, we could bring that together with that. How about that? And then you get thrilling things happening. And I do believe, and I give credit to you, Jane, and others in this room, I do believe we're on the cusp of something very, very important happening here on the ocean. And by the way, new technologies such as AI are gonna transform. I mean, we're, we're about to announce, we believe, a, a sort of a grand challenge we hope to do on, on um, artificial intelligence, what it could do for nature conservation and climate change. My goodness me, what it could do below the surface of the, the sea in, in monitoring um, through facial recognition <laughs> through other forms of recognition. I mean, just incredible what can happen. And we need to be really sort of on the edge of our seats, thinking, pushing that envelope sort of thing. But what do you think, Jane? I think those are great ideas. Um, and I think you're right. Uh, you know, this cross fertilization uh, is, is, is very, very powerful. And that's the opportunity for this meeting. Uh, you know, people who are here coming together and sharing ideas. Um, I think we also need to do a better job of uh, celebrating successes uh, and touting uh, the things that are working. Um, uh, 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 oftentimes, we live in our own little worlds and we assume that everybody knows what we do and knows what we are up to, and yet we have to tell those stories. And so sharing the good things that are underway and celebrating those successes is also contagious. Um, raising awareness with others about the power of ocean solutions. I think this ocean in, in many people's minds is still not front and center, uh, and so the question is how to put it there, and that's you know, uh, opportunities for conversations with your neighbors. Enlarging the table so that we have more uh, voices at the table, more diverse voices at the table uh, is really important. Um, and then connecting the dots for people so that our thinking isn't siloed. All of those, I think, are really, uh, really exciting in terms of opportunities. Um, I know that I gain uh, inspiration and solace uh, and comfort from uh, spending time in or near the ocean, taking my grandkids to the seashore, uh, getting rejuvenated, uh, but also seeing it through their eyes. Um, what about the ocean is intriguing or exciting or inviting to you? Well, um, I didn't know what you were going to ask that question, but it's a, it's a lovely question, actually. Um, I, I, a couple of years ago, as I was sort of, we were getting into this, um, I looked at the, the poetry on the ocean. It's very interesting. Um, and, and what emotions come? It's, it's very one is mysterious, um, dangerous, um, profoundly beautiful, um, incredibly strong, um, irresistible. Um, I grew up in England, and 
you probably have different poetry here, but if you're a, if you're a sort of 11-year-old English kid, there's a famous poem by John Macefield, I must go down to the sea again, the lonely sea and the sky. You know, and they, they don't write that about other things, but they do write it about the sea. And it, it is, and if we, we, I'm talking to the converted here, it, we need that spiritual engagement with the ocean if we're going to be effective. And all of humanity needs that. After all, where do we come from? It, it's got to be, it's got to have a lure, hasn't it? I mean, it really does. It absolutely does. And uh, your quoting and focusing on poetry reminds me of uh, Pablo Neruda, the uh, poet laureate from Chile, um, who said, among many other eloquent things, uh, necesito del mar porque me enseña. I need the sea because it teaches me. And I think that is what we all need. So with that, let us open this up to your questions. Uh, we would or, or be happy rebuttal. to, or, or, or rebuttal. Um, we, although uh, I would prefer we not have long, windy statements and declarations, so let's keep this a conversation. Uh, but we have a couple of microphones uh, in the room uh, and would invite you to raise your hand uh, and uh, pitch some things that you think we've forgotten or ask some questions. Uh, or quote your favorite poetry, Carlotta, Leon Guerrero, right here. How nice to see you. Nice to see you, Jane. Uh, Jane and I are Pew Ocean Commissioners together. Um, what I would like to say is I think that what is missing is support and help for lawmakers um, in, in the Pacific, and specifically in the Pacific, when you're talking about all the countries that came. They have the largest geographic space on the planet, and they have no budget. You go to a country and there will be 18 lawmakers sharing a single attorney. And um, then they're asked to evaluate treaties or try to condense science. So I'd like to know what your thoughts are on the need for lawmaking, uh, the role for lawmakers, and, and what kind of support Bezos Foundation could give to lawmakers. And Car when, when you speak, if you would introduce yourself, please. Uh, and Carlotta is uh, from Guam and has worn many, many hats. Well, um, I agree with everything you just said. Um, and we need to be, we need to ask the question every day on this. I mean, we, we, we put in 100 million, that won't be enough. Um, others need to come in too. Um, we can disperse you know, ahead of others perhaps because we're, we're able to make those decisions. And we need to ask every day, wh wh what are the barriers? That's a barrier. So go after it, go after it. Now what, what philanthropy is less good at is putting money into government coffers. So we, we generally won't be sending money into, into a government account. We actually think that's what government should do. Um, and that's why we like working with governments. I mean, it's, it's really, we love working with the United States government. Um, so, so for example, John Kerry has been very involved in this, obviously. Um, and different parts of the government are. Samantha Power went out to the Pacific. That's incredibly helpful to, um, to, to, to those of us in the philanthropic side. So we need to sort of put the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. And so too, you know, we're working with New Zealand and Australia and the United Kingdom and others that, that need to come in. And they play that very valuable role with government. But we're financing lawyers in several contexts. I mean, one, for example, it came clear to us that that uh, indigenous people who are protecting the forests of the Amazon are not part of the carbon market whatsoever. A lot of money coming in from the carbon markets is going to local governments, central governments, going to the developers, but none of it is going to the people that actually, <laughs> actually are doing the protection. So we are financing lawyers and capacity building so, so indigenous people have a seat at the table. Yes, there's a hand back here. Valerie. Thank you. Afternoon, Jane Andrew. Lovely to see you both. I'm Valerie Hickey. I'm head of the Environment and Ocean at the World Bank. Top tip from each of you on how do we navigate where there is tension in the ocean between the climate change and biodiversity agendas? Take, for example, whale migration and offshore wind energy. Beware of false choices. <laughs> uh, I 
Thank you, Valerie. Um, I do think that there are often uh, win-win solutions. And I think we often are faced with, oh, you have to choose between A and B, when in fact C is a perfectly viable alternative, or you can do A in ways that don't uh, uh, cause harm to B. And so I think finding those solutions and not getting caught in um, an, an either-or uh, situation Understand, and that's where, in fact, scientific information can really help. And that's becoming increasingly challenging in a world with uh, lots of disinformation, misinformation that's out there. Uh, and so that's something that we collectively need to uh, figure out. Uh, and uh, having uh, good information at the table, but having people trust that information and believe that information so we can act on it is critically important. I agree with Jane. And, and by the way, I, uh, Valerie, I, it's, it's really encouraging to see how the World Bank is now taking the, the ocean so seriously. And uh, I know you're going to be speaking later on, so well done. <coughs> yes, Leah, back here. Thank you so much. My name is Leah Gerber. I'm a professor at Arizona State University. I also direct a center, Center for Biodiversity Outcomes, which I established about 10 years ago to address the extinction crisis. So I, I think regularly about why is it that we're still facing this crisis? Why, why hasn't humanity solved this problem? Um, as one of the lead authors for the IPES Global Assessment, a conclusion was that we need a transformation in our social and economic system. So the whole system that, that we live on needs to transform. Um, this is a paradigm shift, yet the extinction issue is a crisis. So we, we, I see this conundrum between a, an urgent need for uh, action, but then we also want to be f informed about action. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how we sort of address that conundrum. So I think for far too long, the case for nature has been made primarily through the need for conservation, the need to protect nature, the need to create protected areas, which is incredibly important. But even if you have 30% of the land and the ocean protected, that's not going to solve the problem unless we pay attention to the other 70%. And so thinking differently about how nature is connected not only to teaching me if I'm Pablo Neruda, uh, but also how it's connected to my health, how it's connected to climate, how it's connected to national security or the economy. And that is part of what we are trying to do with our nature agenda in this administration, is have nature be part of the national security strategy through the concept of natural security. It's actually in the national security strategy for the first time ever. We're putting nature on the economic balance sheet of the country through the natural capital accounts and associated environmental economic statistics. We're connecting the dots to human health. We are connecting the climate and nature agendas. And so taking it, it's not enough to make the case for conservation. We have to make the case for nature, which is not anything new to the IPBES community, but hasn't really penetrated. And so a lot of the nature-based solutions that we uh, are working uh, very uh, diligently on within the administration uh, is aimed at tapping the power of nature to uh, address a lot of uh, other problems, but in ways that value nature and grow nature, not just um, lose nature, if you will. Andrew? Agree with that, and uh, you're absolutely right. We need, we need system change, and one of the really encouraging things is that that concept is now becoming really mainstream. There, there's two ways to think about it, a good way and a bad way. Um, the good way is to actually do what the System Change Lab does. I see over there Annie Desgupta, the president of WRI. WRI and the Basis Earth Fund run something called the System Change Lab. And what we do is we ask, um, so, so what are the 50, so between 50 and 70, sort of major transitions that are required this decade and, and next? 
and, and then get the sharp pencil and ask, what does it actually take to stop deforestation in Southeast Asia? What does it take to stop plastic pollution? It doesn't just stop, it doesn't about regulation, it's about the entire system of producing plastic and, and so you've got to get all the different players in. That's the right way. And so what we do, our entire approach at the Basis Earth Fund, is to use the system change lab to ask, okay, each of these transitions are on a journey. Some of them are stuck. Some of them are actually approaching a positive tipping point. We ask the question, what would it take to get rid of those barriers so that you can get past those tipping points so that change becomes irresistible and unstoppable. And sometimes when they're stuck in the mud, like you know, energy efficiency we ought to have solved years ago, but we haven't for some reason, then you've got to really hit hard with political lobbying, campaigning, and so on like that. That's the right way, I think, for us it is. The wrong way is to say, ooh, you know, our entire economic system is corrupt. We need to throw out capitalism. Um, and <laughs> the answer is, well, good luck. Um, <laughs> it's much better to actually go in and identify where, and there are many places, starting with pricing externalities. And we used to think that putting a price on carbon or putting a price on biodiversity would solve the problem. It goes a long way, but you need a lot more than that. So, um, so, so, so we believe that there is a sort of a professional way of thinking through the, the system change thing. So we'd love to talk to you about it. And one very minor example of that I'll give you uh, is, uh, n not that it's minor, it's just that it's a smaller piece of the puzzle, uh, is the work that uh, the administration has done around nature-based solutions, where we the uh, nature-based solutions um, roadmap that we released uh, at COP27 was really taking a very systematic look at what are the impediments to mainstreaming nature-based solutions across all the different domains, climate, pollution, uh, equity, a whole bunch of other uh, opportunities. Uh, and we're systematically now going through and figuring out how to remove those impediments. Uh, and so uh, I think that systematic approach, what does it take, how do we do it, whose action is it, uh, is, is, is actually very exciting. Um, we are being told by our uh, folks at the back of the room that our time is up. So let me invite Andrew to make uh, any last uh, reflections uh, or give us a, a, a dose of inspiration before we adjourn. No inspiration, but just... Uh I love you guys. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, you think what you, you're all doing. So count on us. We'd love to be part of the journey together with you. And I mean, what a brilliant, what a brilliant journey it is. And thank you to Smithsonian and all the other uh, organizers from the federal government that's played such an important role. Yeah, I too want to thank the uh, interagency group that's been the Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology that's really been working hard on this issue. Uh, and doing all the planning and thinking and inviting all of you. Uh, I think the rest of the afternoon is going to be really exciting. Uh, so this has been a long time in coming, this Ocean Biodiversity Summit. Uh, but uh, if you all help make it a success uh, and you uh, take advantage of the opportunity that I the in, I'd invited you for earlier to comment on the National Ocean Biodiversity Strategy, then together we can really uh, make waves, as Monica was saying, because that, in fact, is what we can do and will do. So thank you all. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, a few times we've heard about the National Ocean and Biodiversity Strategy. I think um, for those of you interested in, in giving your input to the request for information, if you don't have the link, please reach out to me and Emmett and we'll get it to you. Um, we're going to move into that series of conversations that a few of our um, speakers mentioned to explore some key themes that are woven throughout this day. Um, so just a bit of sort of the setup. Each panel will consider an initial guiding question, which the panelists will then reflect on. 
Um, following that, in each of these conversations, we've built in some time, even just a few minutes like we just had, for questions and discussion where we can circulate the microphone and engage, um, engage you. We have runners with the microphones, as you saw, so just raise your hand during any of the Q&A sessions and, and you'll get our attention. Um, so our first panel, and I'll ask them, I think they're starting to convene already. Uh, our first panel focuses on frontline, please, yeah, thank you, on frontline communities, which are often most heavily impacted by climate change, eroding biodiversity, invasive species and pathogens, and over-exploitation of resources. Janie Bavishi, Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere, and NOAA Deputy Administrator, has kindly agreed to guide the conversation. Delivering equitable conservation outcomes and equitable climate services are priorities for Janie, and an important component of our summit. So I'd really like to welcome Janie and the full panel to the stage at this point. And there is a step over here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is a tight squeeze, but I'm honored to share the stage uh, today with this group of inspiring leaders um, to discuss the impacts of shifting and declining biodiversity in marine and coastal environments on frontline communities who often uh, disproportionately carry the burden of harm from climate change. I was very excited to chat with Gabrielle and Emmett a few months ago and hear their commitment to making the connection between people's interaction with nature and what that means for advancing equity, or on the flip side, the perpetuation of inequities in our communities. It's a topic that I believe we explore far too infrequently. And yet, when I had a chance to speak to the panelists just before the summit, the conversation hit on topics as diverse as economic opportunity and livelihoods, to subsistence traditions and other cultural practices, to equitable access to nature for well-being, recreation, and education. So I'm looking forward to unpacking these themes uh, with our panelists today in this very intimate conversation, as well as any of their experiences with or ideas for solutions that can support the sustainable and equitable management of coastal and marine resources that benefit both nature and people. Um, I'm just going to name our panelists and then let them introduce their, themselves. So our panel includes, and I'll, I'll start from the far side, Anita Skupta, uh, Ila Sita Carpenter, Hermina Glass-Hill, Josh Tenorio, and Megan Anders. <laughs> to get us started, I'll ask each panelist, as Gabrielle mentioned, to introduce themselves and also um, offer their reflections on the following question. In your experience, what are the major concerns of the frontline communities that you know and work with related to biodiversity loss and change? And before I turn it over to the panelists, I wanna let the audience know that we do hope to save some time for questions, so please be thinking about those, um, uh, and we'll, we'll turn to you at the end. Um, so, Ani, would you like to get us started? Um, absolutely. Uh, first of all, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you for including me in this. I, I, what I'm going to say is actually pretty much a continuation of what Andrew and Jane was talking about. I just want to, um, so I, I head WRI, which is a 40-year-old climate organization. It's been working on climate for a long time. But we, we, we arrived at ocean because the science after Paris, or since Paris actually, between climate and ocean is exponentially better. I mean, what climate does for ocean, ocean does for climate, et cetera. And, and so, but we, what ultimately we found in this work is actually the economics of ocean, the economy that drives ocean and exploitation is what is more important in, in what is happening to ocean, what, how do we change course. So I just want to, I want to situate how we came to this. So we actually host, the, what I'm going to say next is dependent on, we host something called a high level ocean panel. This is 18 countries and head of states coming together on 100% ocean. So you heard 70% and 30%, 100% sustainable ocean management. And we also host with um, Carlos Manuel for uh, Jeff, the HAC, the High Ambition Coalition of 118 countries that is seeking to protect 30% of land and water. So what I'm gonna say is, is, is from this perspective of what does the economics of ocean do and what does it talk about, which means what do people 
and the root cause of what's happening to the ocean. I mean, it, the basic numbers are, everyone knows the basic numbers, about two trillion, about two trillion dollars of the global economy just come from the ocean. 237 million jobs comes from the ocean. But the more important part is 10% of global GDP any given year. But the most important part is three billion people are dependent on their livelihood for the ocean economy. Three billion people out of seven and a half billion. And one billion of them are dependent of the daily um, food directly from ocean. And what's happening to the ocean, you just heard um, uh, Jane and Andrew talked about it, that it's a disruption that is taking place and must, mostly in the equatorial region, and it's impacting vulnerable communities much more than other parts of the world. The changes that's taking place, the changes that is taking place on the food system, the changes that are taking place on the uh, tourism-related jobs and things like that. But what I want to point out is our work looked at not just protecting the 30 percent, but Jane was pointing out that how does the 70 percent sustainability of the 70 percent depend, the 30 percent protection dependent on the 70 percent we manage together. And we looked at how the economy, how the people who are dependent on this actually needs to work differently. Just to summarize uh, on this, what we found is if the 70% is managed properly and the capacity that's needed for the livelihood of the people who depend on it, but also the benefit it can provide of many, many more jobs for the same people. Renewable energy, someone asked a question about, um, I think Valerie asked a question of whales, and there's a huge opportunity, 30 times opportunity of renewable energy if managed properly that can provide uh, not only employment but en energy. So this, this source of managing ocean, I think what we need here, at least from our finding, is, is looking at ocean and its biodiversity and the employment or the livelihood that's dependent on it and the cultural artifacts that depend on it needs to be, as Andrew was just saying, needs to be seen as a system that is dependent on each other. And we need to take a systems approach and also change, I think, the narrative of ocean that it is a source of many solutions in multiple sectors that we need to do together. I'm happy to share, I hope you ask more, many more questions, happy to share more of what we are finding, but this approach to looking at people, climate, and nature together actually has provided us a lot of insight toward what the solutions might look like. Thanks so much, Annie. Ela, would you like to go next? Uh, sure, is this on? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Ela Carpenter. Um, I feel a little out of place. Um, I am with the Masonville Cove Urban Wildlife Refuge Partnership. We are not on the ocean. We are on the Middle Branch waterfront in South Baltimore. Um, and it has a very interesting history of at one time having been a waterfront town community. Um, nearby industrial companies began buying up land. It became uh, bought up by the 50s and then for 50 years it was an industrial dumping ground. Um, and then back in the early 2000s, a massive restoration process uh, began where 61,000 tons of debris was taken away. Um, the community helped build, um, I'm sorry, plant shoreline plants. We put thousands of reef balls in the cove there. Um, we have a solar-powered trash wheel there named Captain Trash Wheel, and if you're not familiar with Baltimore's famous trash wheels, you should check them out. Um, and so for the past 10 years, it's been what we call an urban wildlife refuge partnership. Uh, so not a traditional fish and wildlife refuge, but instead multiple organizations help take care of this land. And so that includes the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Maryland Port Administration, National Aquarium, and Living Classrooms Foundation. And so we all work together um, to help take care of this land, find funding to support the programs that we do both on and off site. Um, and so in that part of South Baltimore, Masonville Cove is the only publicly accessible waterfront. Um, we're primarily industrial in that part of South Baltimore, so this is the closest spot for the Curtis Bay and Brooklyn communities um, to access the waterfront, to be in a nature space that is at the water. Um, and so in the past 10 years of this uh, partnership and this land being available for the public, we've spent a lot of time working with uh, the communities in Brooklyn and Curtis Bay, which is just right across the industrial road, the rail yard, and 895 uh, across from us. So, they're physically separated from us, and so a lot of our work has been with 
um, finding ways to make it more accessible for them to be there, um, not just telling them to come to us, but going to them and having programs and opportunities in their communities and honestly just spending a lot of time listening. Uh, and so when I heard the question, I initially struggled with how to answer it because it was very focused on biodiversity. And my experience for the past three years that I've been um, with the partnership is that all these different issues are kind of intertwined, connected with each other. Uh, and so when we are listening to um, our neighbors in Brooklyn and Curtis Bay, we're listening to issues of uh, physical and mental health issues, um, safety. Um, Curtis Bay has an open air coal deposit in the neighborhood, so people have stories of coal dust falling from the nearby uh, depot onto their front yards, onto their cars and things like that. And so I think the past 10 years of listening to these issues, building relationships, um, it's hard for me to focus just on biodiversity. And I feel like biodiversity can help solve some of these issues. So it helps the physical and mental health to be in these waterfront spaces. Um, having clean air and water, when they get to see examples of what happens when you restore a place like Masonville Cove that had 61 tons of debris taken away. Um, and now we have bald eagles that live there and things like that. And so for us, I think the main thing has just been listening to the community, finding out where uh, the assets are in the community, and then learning to use conservation as a tool to support um, what those communities need. And so by using conservation as a tool for that, we are connecting those seemingly dis bear it or different issues together. I'm, I'm not supposed to offer any reflections until the end, but I'm just gonna take moderator's privilege here because I think it's amazing that we've had one speaker, Ani, offer a global perspective and Ela offer a much more local perspective and really hit on the same theme about integrated solutions and the connections between people, climate, nature, climate and nature and looking to biodiversity and our ocean and coastal environments for the solutions. Hermina, would you like to go next? Sure. I am Hermina Glass Hill. I am a public historian and ocean conservationist with Oceana, and I also am on the um, um, Gray's Reef Advisory Council, Sanctuary Advisory Council. That's um, a, a area off of the coast of Sapelo Island in Georgia. I come to this space, um, and, and I struggle too with my answer uh, because I'm coming from a totally different perspective as a historian. And um, I, I, I come to you this morning in the tradition of my people, uh, in the tradition of Harriet Tubman, in the tradition of Sojourner Truth, in the tradition of Phyllis Wheatley, and in the tradition of Fannie Lou Hamer. I consider myself to be an ocean abolitionists working in the same uh, same vein as as protecting our ocean as well as our people from the harms uh, caused by pollution uh, uh, and and so forth so when it comes to my work um, as an ocean abolitionist uh, I try to wrangle in and win successes for Oceana and my people in terms of um, tackling the whale lynchings that are taking place let's be honest about what's taking place with North Atlantic right whales they are being lynched uh, as well as being impacted by vessel strikes and so uh, when it comes to the communities that I represent, uh, which are various intersectional communities, um, we know sea level rise and we know flooding and we, we know uh, that communities are disproportionately impacted by um, the, the heat island uh, effect. And so, um, but I would posit that as we think about who can contribute stories, who can contribute to um, this space and what kinds of stories can be contributed to the space, I think about the Middle Passage. I think about someone said that the ocean is the greatest source of transportation on the globe. And when we talk about African descended people in this country, one of the commonalities that connect us is the Middle Passage. It is the Middle Passage. So as we think about solutions in terms of mitigating climate change, uh, adapting to climate change, uh, let's consider what um, 
preserving and protecting parts of uh, the, the middle passage routes and what that means in intersecting the kinds of parts of the ocean that we want to protect when it comes to 3030. And so um, when we see that um, there is this, uh, you know, in the, in the vein of, uh, since I mentioned Sojourner Truth, in the vein of the inequities, uh, the racial in inequities, who's at the table, who's making these decisions, we have to be truth tellers about why these inequities exist, hear the stories of people, work from that place of truthfulness and build relationships with communities, uh, build trust with communities so that they can buy into why it's necessary, critical at this point, at this juncture in our history to pre preserve this sacred resource, I'm a person of faith, the sacred resource that nourishes and protects all of us. So I would, I, I would say, you know, who are the people at the table? How do we help them gain access? How do we hear their stories and integrate their stories into the overall solutions of protecting the ocean? Thank you, Hermina, for really giving voice to uh, the importance of acknowledging and understanding histories. Lieutenant Governor Tenorio. Half a day. I'm Josh Tenorio. I'm serving, privileged to serve my second term as a Lieutenant Governor of Guam. And in 2019, when Governor Leon Guerrero and I took uh, office, uh, we decided to empower our island uh, to adopt the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals and to establish the Guam Green Growth and place it at the University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability as a way to ensure that the work um, remains academic, that we in government empower um, uh, education, but more importantly, to have access to young people who are really, really, I think, going to be the best champions of the work that is happening in the front line. So let me first start by uh, thanking everybody uh, who is here for the work that you're doing. Uh, just imagine the kind of work that you're doing, you have done, and imagine if you weren't in this place, if you didn't have this authority, if you weren't enabling the kind of work and the research that is occurring right now. But I also want you to really challenge yourself and figure out, is your work relevant? How is it relevant? Who is it benefiting? Uh, is it benefiting indigenous people who are living in places that may not exist in, uh, in the course of uh, real time? And so the entire Pacific um, is agreed that uh, sea level rise and climate change is an existential threat um, last week there was tidal waves going on in Kwajalein, uh, which is an atoll in the Marshall Islands that the U.S. uses for strategic purposes um, that hadn't been seen in quite a long time. It's an indication of some rapid, unexpected, violent things that can happen to low-lying communities. And in Guam, um, we established the Guam Green Growth, uh, affiliated with Hawaii Green Growth. It's an opportunity, it's a public-private partnership that allows us to recognize the kind of work that is happening in our front line, um, and using that as a way to blend government, uh, civil society, and individuals uh, to figure out what are the most rapid or biggest threats that we're facing and see what's unfunded, uh, coordinate action, or uh, use it as our government is doing uh, to push discretionary funds or opportunities so that we can really, really identify projects that are at risk. And let me just give you a little glimpse on um, the kind of threats that we have. Um, we're living in a reality, and I'll just tell you, you know, our, the Chamorro people, the indigenous people of Guam have been there for thousands of years. So I will tell you I'm very optimistic that if we can overcome wars and uh, famines and uh, all sorts of things, modernity, Western um, uh, militarization, all sorts of things, certainly we can do things to empower ourselves to stay on the island that we have called home for thousands of years. We will always stay there, uh, which is a challenge. But um, what I wanted to say is that uh, we're dealing with uh, issues such as biodiversity, right? We have uh, the Caribbean has a big problem right now with their coral reefs because of a virus that has spread. These ships come into our ports. Who is looking at the science and the methods to 
uh, cure the virus, uh, to make sure that it doesn't tra uh, traverse the, the world, uh, to make sure that the spread is contained. I come from an island with 350 species of coral. Hawaii has 100, the entire Caribbean only has 60. And 10 years ago, there's been a lot of study, we, learned, we lost one third of our stock because of a mass coral bleaching effort. Uh, what are we doing about it? We, empower, we are doing pretty cool stuff, uh, working on watershed restoration, using drones to plant trees to prevent erosion in some hard areas, costly areas that, uh, that laborers involved to try and push back against that. Uh, we're doing things like uh, embracing science and uh, an, a what really cool project, uh, photographing uh, periodic, regularly, um, the coral reef beds around the island. In fact, uh, just so happened uh, that we got hit by a super typhoon, first time in 20 years, uh, and we happen to have the crew planned to be there. So we're able to really understand and figure out what kind of damage there is and also understanding what we need to do in, ter in terms of time to go back. Um, I'll leave you with this. Uh, Noah, I want to thank you. Uh, you, and I think uh, enabled a lot by Secretary Kerry, um, is funding an initiative called the Local Islands 2030 at least the U.S.'s participation through Hawaii Guam, uh, Green Growth and Guam Green Growth. What we've been doing is we've been working with the university and establishing uh, and encouraging green growths to uh, establish throughout our region. Local Islands 2030, regardless of your political status, it's a network of islands from around the world seeking to learn and teach each other about what is working on the different front lines. And so just to go back, when you think about what are the relevant things that your agency or your funds are going to, um, really try and pinpoint whether or not it's actually going to be useful, whether it's going to be empowering, or if it's going to be in the way of what uh, needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you. And Megan, I know you want to use the podium, so I will step down. Okay, got it. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I just want to acknowledge uh, my panelists here. It's an honor to share this stage with you. And um, thank you for sharing your power and strength. I could feel it. And so, uh, yeah, my name is um, Megan Shukshuk Anders, and I'm from Nome, Alaska. I'm a King Islander, a Guv Milhurunga, Sitnasak Milhurunga. Guvuk is an island in the middle of the Bering Strait. And um, so we're in the border herd relationship between the United States and Russia. And by the mainland, Inuit call us uh, meaning people of the ocean, because we're uh, right in the middle of huge marine mammal migrations. I serve as a very new deputy director of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee at the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy at the Executive Office of the President. That is a, a mouthful, but it's uh, really relevant and important work. OSTP works with federal agencies with Congress to create clear plans, unified strategies, and equitable programs for science and technology. I am based in Nome, which affords me the opportunity to continue living with my community. Sorry. Learn my language. Ogivamutun, um, which is a dialect of the Inupiaq language. I'm, I'm the daughter of an Inuit linguist. Uh, my mother's generation is among the last to speak their language due to colonization, the, the era of um, forced relocation, the boarding school era. But I am also witness to a revitalization. I'm the sister to uh, an Unibelk immersion school teacher, so our language is being taught to the next generation. And my mother, she always shares how our knowledge systems, our indigenous knowledge systems are embedded in our languages. And that's why it's you know really important that our languages are alive. Sorry, I didn't mean to cry here, but... Um, at OSTP, I worked to uplift and advance the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area, and it's a marine protected area that was established by President Biden and among 
his first executive orders. The area represents 112,300 square miles of ocean and is home to over 70 federally recognized tribes. The region is culturally and linguistically diverse, including Siberian Yupik, Central Yupik, well, Siberian Yupik is actually uh, technically correct, St. Lawrence Island Yupik, uh, and then uh, Inupiat communities. And so there's many, many dialects that you know connect our communities from Russia all the way United States uh, across the top of the Arctic, Canada, and Greenland. And you know the Arctic is really an amazing, uh, culturally diverse place. To quote the executive order, um, the climate, the changing climate and rising average temperatures are reducing the occurrence of sea ice, changing the conditions for fishing, hunting, and subsistence whaling, and opening new navigable routes to increase ship traffic. The preservation of a healthy and resilient bearing ecosystem, including migratory pathways, habitat, and breeding grounds is essential for the survival of marine mammals, fish, seabirds, and other wildlife, and the subsistence communities that depend on them. This EO highlights the geopolitical and uh, biodiversity importance of this region to the United States. President Biden, as many of you know here, has delivered the most ambitious climate agenda in history. And many teams across the agencies are working to equip Americans with the best available science and understanding for climate change and impacts to the United States. Our coastal and island communities in the Bering Strait region remain rich with cultural and traditional wealth that has, you know, that is reflected in the immense biodiversity of the region. Uh, like I shared earlier, we are witness uh, to large marine mammal migrations from the Pacific to the Arctic, including walrus, whales, seals, migratory birds, and fish species. At the core of the health and cultural wealth of our communities is the health and the marine biodiversity of the region. Uh, climate change is very real to many of us who are living a native way of life. We are observing the environment every single day, and many of our hunters can tell you, depending on the direction of the wind, where the migrating animals might be. And so it, it is truly um, where that expertise in the environment observation comes from. Our communities remain on the forefront of climate threats, which mean cultural threats, which mean food security, which mean human health threats. Uh, since 2011, our hunters have experienced two federally designated marine mammal unusual mortality events, or UMEs. We are witness to the crash of crab species, the crash of salmon species that support the cultural and commercial livelihoods of the region. Our tribes of the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area have prioritized salmon rehabilitation and urged our agencies to take action on restoring fish species. Uh, during 2017 to 2022, the region's residents, with the support of Alaska Sea Grant, monitored seabird die-offs that were due to starvation. Even more recently, we've witnessed avian influenza transfer from waterfowl to seabirds, as well as crossover to um, fox species in, in our region. The crossover of avian influenza uh, to black and brown bears has also occurred in Alaska, and is now, uh, just this last October, there was reports of the first polar bear death due to a crossover of avian influenza. In 2022, NOAA and Woods Hole confirmed the first ever uh, presence of harm, uh, the largest ever presence of harmful algae blooms in the Bering Strait region. It wasn't the first time HABs were detected uh, by local observers. 2014 was the first suspected human illness of paralytic shellfish poisoning due to HABs. 2020 was the first human fatality in the Bering Sea in the community of Unalaska due to paralytic shellfish poisoning. The important work of informing our tribes and our tribal organizations, our hunters and our providers uh, to ensure they have the science and the information they need to govern remains ongoing and real. And in this last year, we were super fortunate to have researchers on the vessel connected with our tribal health organization. And our tribal health organization were able to respond immediately by training our local healthcare providers. What are the, um, what are the 
what to look for when you're looking for paralytic shellfish poisoning, how to respond. And so that direct relationship with science is, is super important to responding to real-time events. Um, it truly is an honor to serve in the Biden administration and be on the forefront of working to advance environmental justice and in advance indigenous knowledge in federal decision making. And it was just over a year ago that um, the White House issued a historic memorandum to the agencies to promote a government-wide effort to improve the recognition of indigenous knowledge. And while it is historic, we have much work to do. And um, like I shared earlier, the urgency remains with my generation. Uh, let me stop there and thank you. And uh, sorry again, I'm in tears. <laughs> Well, thank you to all of our panelists for sharing such powerful perspectives. I am going to open it up to the audience for your questions. And again, please introduce yourself before asking your yes, question. Yes, of course. Thank you. My name is Pete Gerges. Uh, I'm on the faculty at Harvard University. Thank you all for such wonderful and powerful stories. I have one question, and that is, if I, if we acknowledge that the communication and interaction among different communities, uh, meaning you know, local communities, uh, state governance, federal governments, the scientific community that I'm a part of, right? If that connection, if we all can agree that, that we need to do work in communicating, what would be one thing you would like to see happen that would enable uh, better communications between the communities you're engaged with and other communities? What's something we could do to, to, to really bolster that, that crosstalk. Thank you. I would say for um, my communities throughout the Southeast, um, at Oceana, um, I created a, uh, an initiative called the African American Gullah Geechee Ocean Leaders Alliance. And um, that is to um, a poll, elevate, and to amplify black African American Gullah Geechee voices when it comes to um, how stories are told, how sustainability operates in communities, how conservation works in terms of um, fisheries and uh, uh, the shorelines and uh, preserving um, areas where migratory uh, 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 shorebirds are or what have you. Um, I think that um, integrating their stories into a strategic plan, uh, knowing that this is an oral community that originated as an oral community as a result of enslavement, learning, uh, integrating African languages with um, English, so forth and so on. So it's still very much an oral culture. And like uh, my sister here has just stated, um, it is one that is critical at this time because what, in, what is impacting um, African American Gullah Geechee communities now now is development and the corruption of development in which there's all of this private land being um, uh, acquired by developers. We've seen the, the case with the, uh, uh, the elder woman in South Carolina in which a developer was trying to uh, really appropriate and steal her property. Um, and so when it comes to how um, scientists and um, academicians and so forth can be a part of the solution is uh, understand and be conscientious of this oral culture, oral histories, uh, and how we communicate and have um, survived over the last 400 years through nature, through a relationship with our waterways, through a relationship with oceans and trees. And so um, as quiet as it's kept, many people believe that African Americans, Gullah Geechee people don't, don't, have, uh, don't believe in sustainability. It's how we got through. It's how we survived. Um, we've been doing sustainability sustainability uh, ever since we've been here, you know, from sharing our clothes, uh, reusing things. That's a part of our sustainability story. Um, saving oyster shells, uh, so forth and so on. That's how we do it. So if the stories, um, if stories can be integrated into those solutions, um, that would be most appreciative. And it will um, let these communities from North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida know that um, 
Our government is listening. And even when it comes to infrastructure, we need those stories told too. Because when there is inclement weather, when there is um, uh, sea level rise, not only is it just flooding, it's saltwater intrusion, it impacts their land, it impacts their animals, it impacts the marsh, it impacts uh, our whole way of living. And so I think that um, understanding these, um, you know, we, we look at uh, what's tangible, but it's also these intangible assets that matter also. Can I just add, for me, it's uh, trying to realize a center for excellence on climate and biodiversity. Uh, and I think that um, when you're in an academic setting, especially in a land grant and a sea grant institution, you have a responsibility to be relevant to your community. And so uh, there's a big interplay there in, the, in academia where you empower students, you are able to bring your legitimacy uh, your, uh, into uh, practice. And I think that um, in the front line, right, uh, as she said, you know, we're, you have to be uh, sustainable in order to live on the island, right? Uh, unfortunately, right now, most of the islands are inundated and dependent on things from outside, right? But that's really counter to our DNA. Uh, so I really think that um, the focal point, I think, is going to be on the academic side, blending that with a moral and a formal obligation to be relevant into the community, to solve problems, to be able to uh, put science into practice and develop some programs that, and in Guam, uh, just, just a... We're the center for Micronesia. In order to get out to the Federated States of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, to Palau, you have to come through us, which means that we're also a big risk to them. You know, so uh, the U.S. military, as you might know, has a considerable amount of things they're doing on the island, very expansive to even what they're thinking about last year. We have major invasive species. I want to mention one. We have a rhino beetle that is decimating our coconut trees. And if you know island culture, if there's no coconut, there's no people, right? We have like 20 some names for different things and our utilization. So when we talk about existential threat, it's no joke. Uh, but I really think that, uh, ac uh, that academic science, uh, the media, the youth, those are the ways that you counter and uh, push back. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm Jennifer Harris-Baxter. I am the State Department liaison to the Smithsonian Institution for Science, which is a, an excellent privilege uh, to serve as. But my question uh, actually came up because of the wonderful things that, that you all brought up just now uh, to me as a mom of a public school elementary school, school kid. And I heard a little emphasis there on the youth, but I feel like a lot of times what we are able to touch, what we're able to focus on is 18 and up. And the future of the table that, that Jane so eloquently described is still in school, and our kids get 40 minutes of science a week. So I'm curious, since you all are on the front line, you are the closest to understanding what a potential solution might look like. What would you suggest as a way to break down that system and get to a better place in terms of what we can prepare our kids to be able to do? Thanks. I'll answer that. Um, in the state of Georgia, the great state of Georgia, um, <laughs> our state marine mammal is none other than the North Atlantic right whale. So there are third, fourth, fifth graders who are learning about the state marine mammal. Um, also, um, the elementary school kids are our greatest advocates in the state of Georgia. As you know, when it comes to uh, protecting North Atlantic right whales, Georgia is a very contentious state. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, our leadership, our, our uh, uh, congressman has, you know, uh, caused dissension when it comes to protecting North Atlantic right whales. We have one of the busiest ports in the country, uh, the Savannah Port, uh, which is, um, you know, a huge threat uh, with these large container ships coming in and um, the whales uh, transversing um, um, the, 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 the ships coming in. But young people are the greatest supporters of 
of uh, North Atlantic right wells, and I'll say in December, um, just to get elected officials' attention, um, there were nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds creating um, videos to send to Senator Warnock and Senator uh, John Ossoff to let them know that they care about their future, and when they get to be an adult, they want to know that right wells are still there. I think we may have time for one more question. Hi, I'm, Hi, I'm Karen Bigelow with Creation Justice Ministries. Um, I'm curious, one of the big parts of a community is around faith and there is a social capital that's often um, within places of worship that I don't think we always utilize. And so I'm curious to know if there's any opinions on how um, faith-based communities can better work um, with your communities, given that often we are also within your communities. Let me say that uh, faith-based organizations have been so effective uh, on the criminal justice front, uh, you know, trying to help marginalized folks, people from long-term incarceration, you know, get back into the community. I think the reality is that we're in living in such a divided body politic that a considerable amount of faith-based leaders um, don't subscribe to the real to climate uh, action or the need for climate action. Uh, th that's part of the narrative that unfortunately has seeped in. Um, some uh, faiths are doing different things, you know. Uh, so uh, the Pope and the Dalai Lama uh, that are embracing um, uh, sustainability and understanding that there is an issue going on and calling for action are helpful. But I think that it's going to be really, um, going back to the last question, it's going to be the kids. You know, the most, the most effective marketing campaign in the United States, I feel, is the seatbelt thing, right? Click it or tick, whatever it is in your community. Kids are the ones that are telling the parents, you better put on your seatbelt or this happens. So I feel that, um, you know, this loss of science time, of the arts, of PE, you know, that I, I wasn't in the generation when that happened. It really matters. Uh, and I think that uh, those that are influential on the educational academia, the folks that are in the business of education, need to maybe um, try and influence them to come up with curriculum on sustainability, to you know do the most basic things, right, uh, and to be aware. And I think the best thing is localized curriculum. And just to plug again for our, our program, we funded uh, programs to be able to use the natural sciences and the research that was done on Guam to help uh, come up with field trip uh, or science project things, right? It was clear during the pandemic, during the isolation, that a lot of the uh, stuff that we had locally wasn't available to the kids, right? Uh, and it gave us really a good opportunity to think, well, we need, to go, we need to start enabling that to happen. I, I really think it's going to be with the kids there, the moral conscience of all of us. Uh, and uh, they are probably going to be able to turn even the faith-based leaders into making sure that they remember what's happening right now because they're the ones most affected. All of us may, are, may be escaping uh, things that are, uh, they might have to experience, but that should compel us to pick up our pace and do so much more. Can I make a brief comment? I, I, I didn't expect I would respond to this question, though I, I run a, a global science-based organization. Um, but one of our fastest growing, large, fastest growing program is called Faith and Sustainability. And it is about working with faith leaders and faith community, including the Pope, including NU in uh, Indonesia, the biggest Islamic organization in Indonesia, to provide um, knowledge about sustainability to them. They're asking for it. And our belief, in our job, your question, going back to your question, what do we need to do? We have to change people's minds, how people frame things, how people, what's the, how people think about a problem, and what best uh, uh, that you can do. That's why we're investing on it. And I just want to say this is the fastest growing program of, of our faith leaders asking for, you've seen the Pope uh, actually burning out one after another, sustainability related things. And then we have found, this is the last thing, is how much property faith organization had, if they took steps to make them sustainable, how much impact communities would have. So that's why we are working on that. But thank you very much for asking the question. 
I can just make a closing comment on that, how important that the environment is to indigenous spirituality, that it, the environment is our faith. And I think we can't lose that when we're having conversations about biodiversity, because if we lose our biodiversity, if we lose our environment, we very much lose our connection to our faith at a very uh, real level. Uh, well, I have to close this out, um, but uh, th wow, what an inspiring panel. Thank you all for offering such powerful perspectives. Thank you for reminding us of the urgency of the need to find solutions. Thank you for reminding us to look to community and culture for as a source of those solutions. Let's give our panel a round of applause. I promise we'll find a way to shift the podium for the next large panel. So it's three o'clock. We'd like to invite you to have a coffee and maybe some refreshment and um, ponder some of what we've heard so far um, before we convene again in another half an hour. Thank you so much.
Hello, everyone. We're about to start our second panel, so uh, now would be the time to take your coffee to your seats, and we'll get started. So welcome back, everyone. We've had a fantastic conversation and, and panels uh, over the last couple of hours, and one of the things that struck me is the different concepts of, of value, of how people value nature and biodiversity. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about in this next panel. Uh, we know that uh, the ocean and its life are under pressure from many directions, and so we need this understanding of value, how, how the value um, is understood by all of the different communities that live with the ocean in order to really affect change. So this panel is going to explore opportunities um, for that and how we grapple with valuing biodiversity uh, in, its, in, in its many uh, facets and its importance, again, to human communities uh, and nature, as we saw uh, in the last one. So uh, we're grateful to uh, Shannon Estenos, uh, Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife and Parks um, at, at the Department of the Interior, who will be moderating uh, the panel today, the conversation. So I'd like to invite Shannon and our second panel to the stage, please. Hello? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I, I've been sitting on this side, so I happen to know that no one over there can see half of our panel. So if we can just lean over and wave. <laughs> um, acknowledge that you are here with your listening ears on, and thank you for it. Um, good afternoon. I'm Shannon Estenos. I'm the Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife and Parks at the Department of the Interior. I want to acknowledge right off the bat that Anytime I'm involved in any conversation about the ocean, I want to acknowledge that my agency's name is descriptively unhelpful <laughs> when it comes to our work related to uh, coastal ecosystems, marine ecosystems, the Great Lakes. But in fact, our missions uh, are central, uh, or the marine ecosystems and marine systems and marine biodiversity is central to our mission, is what I should say, whether it is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's regulatory programs and its public lands, the National Park Service, of course, which are the two bureaus I oversee. Um, we all also, Interior is involved in energy leasing, both on land and offshore. Um, and of course, Ambassador Carmen Cantor, who is our Assistant Secretary for, Indian, uh, for Insular Affairs. Um, as well, we uh, play a role with NOAA in regulating a number of species, including uh, subsist very important subsistence resources like in places like Alaska. So salmon, salmon is a, a creature that we share jurisdiction over and one that is very sensitive to, to climate change. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, I'm honored to be here, I'm always grateful. On a personal note, I'm a fifth generation Key West conch, so the ocean is in my DNA. All four of my grandparents were born in Key West and so, um, the marine system is very important uh, culturally and spiritually and uh, to, to us as well. So um, this afternoon we're joined by uh, a very distinguished panel uh, who are going to share their perspectives on the topic of uh, valuing uh, biodiversity for conservation in the blue economy. We know that when ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes resources are utilized sustainably, they can power economic growth, prosperity, and eco ecosystem health. And that, of course, contributes to climate change mitigation adaptation and specific sectors of the economy, including tourism and fisheries, for example. It is a foundation, foundational principle of this summit that biodiversity is a good, good, it's a good good, it's a good public good, 
Um, you don't hear anymore a lot of normative debate about whether biodiversity is it good, is it bad. Um, it's like kind of like clean air and clean water. We know that it's good. Um, but the, what we have to wrestle to the ground is often is how good, how important is it, what is its value, and then how do we account for that value. And I, I, I so enjoyed both um, Andrew Steer and Dr. Lubchenko's conversation. I really enjoyed the previous panel because I think they were getting to this idea of value. How do we account for the value of biodiversity? I oversee a regulatory agency. I can say with confidence that our regulatory structures to protect species are important but completely insufficient to protect biodiversity. If we are relying on even tough laws like the Endangered Species Act and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act to protect biodiversity, we are gonna fail. It, it is, these laws are important but insufficient, necessary but insufficient. So how do we do it then? How do we imbue uh, an intrinsic value of biodiversity into uh, our calculations, uh, whether they are decisions about resource management and resource development, investment decisions, economic decisions. The more that we understand the value of biodiversity, the more it becomes a foundational principle of the, the sort of rational decision making when it comes um, to our resources. So with that, um, intro, I'm going to turn to our panel. And what I'm going to ask is that each of you uh, um, take about five minutes to introduce yourselves and share your perspective on this topic by answering the following question. What is needed to ensure that we understand the true value of biodiversity and its worth to human communities and economies? I'll repeat it for everyone. What is needed to ensure that we understand the true value of biodiversity and its worth to human communities and economies. And uh, we will start with you, Kevin. Oh no, I was gonna go last. Okay, you're gonna go last. <laughs> Who would like to go first? I'd like to be democratic about it. Chris. All right, sure. <laughs> That's how democratic I am. Chris. I'm used to that, I'm used to that. So. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, my name's Chris Horton. I'm the Senior Director of Fisheries Policy for the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. Uh, I work with members, the bipartisan members of the U.S. Uh, the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, um, the bipartisan members of the state legislative sportsman's caucuses in all 50 states, as well as members of the Governor's Sportsman's Caucus on hunting and fishing. I'll do the fishing part and fishing and aquatic resource conservation uh, policies. <clears throat> I'm an avid angler, started my career as a fisheries biologist uh, with a state agency and had no inclination that fisheries management had any politics involved, but man, <laughs> was I wrong? And, and so here I am today uh, working in the, in the policy realm on fisheries stuff. But, you know, as a fisheries biologist, I understand the value of biodiversity, but it's very difficult to explain what biodiversity is to the, to the average person. It's even more difficult sometimes to try to quantify what we mean or what our goals are for biodiversity. I mean, do we have a really good understanding of the baseline from which we're starting? or where we're trying to go, is, it, is the carrying capacity even there to, to enhance biodiversity and to what degree? And would we recognize whenever we've achieved success because the goalposts are often moving with influencers like, influences like climate change. So again, I understand the value of biodiversity, but it's a very, those are very difficult questions to answer. So the average angler, the word biodiversity is even more abstract. You know, it's a term that they hear scientists and, and environmental organizations use a lot, but they really don't grasp what it means. For some, it actually has a negative connotation. It's something that they perceive the government could use to leverage, uh, to leverage biodiversity to, to shut them out of their favorite fishing spots. That said, the truth is biodiversity drives a lot of, drives where we fish a lot of the times because it, they just don't know it. I mean, the areas we fish are gonna have higher catch rates, more species diversity because they're, they're, the species richness is better because of the habitat's just better. And if you look at coastal communities with great habitat nearby, people come from all over the United States and all over the world to fish those areas. So there's tremendous value in biodiversity. 
you know, one of the things that is most important is having that healthy habitat there and being able to manage for that habitat. Uh, if you look at places that have, have those, those types of great fisheries, like the Florida Keys, for instance, or Venice, Louisiana, people come from everywhere to fish those places. Now, in Venice, Louisiana, the whole Louisiana coastline, we've seen a tremendous impact to the estuaries there because of coastal subsidence. But still, it's one of the richest, most diverse fisheries in the world. And again, people come from, from all over to fish the Louisiana coastline. However, there, there are some many anglers that fish in the Gulf, and some that fish in California, really are questioning somewhat the government's sincerity about protecting biodiversity and, and habitat. Whether you like them or not, offshore oil, if you really want to go fish one of the most, or, or see one of the most diverse uh, marine ecosystems off our coastline, go fishing or diving around an oil and gas platform. There, the, in 2014, a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences concluded that offshore oil and gas platforms off of California had the highest secondary fish production of any habitat studied. A 2020 study for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management noted that the removal of oil and gas platforms in the northern Gulf of Mexico is likely having substantial adverse impacts on fish communities. And, but it's not just fish. A 2004 study published in the Marine Ecology Progress Series looking at coral uh, in the Gulf of Mexico uh, found that, or, or concluded that corals have contributed to the spread, or uh, uh, oil and gas platforms have contributed to the spread uh, of coral populations in, in the Gulf. And two of the species that are found in relative abundance on those structures are actually listed on the IUCN critically endangered list, yet we're, we're taking them out. There's no question, it took decades for these ecosystems to evolve on these things. To recruit, yet we're, we're we're taking them out, and once the whales are capped and plugged and isolated, there is an opportunity to come and rig the reef program, but that is a real challenge as we have so many coming out so quickly. So, there's no question that these habitats have tremendous economic and cultural values to the communities that are located nearby. The question is, are we willing to embrace these novel ecosystems? as a way to, as a tool for enhancing biodiversity, for enhancing climate resiliency, for taking pressure off the natural reefs in the areas. If we can do that, if, if we embrace that and, and look to expand uh, opportunities to enhance biodiversity through artificial habitats or, or strategic siting of offshore wind uh, or the use of other suitable reefing materials, then you can make that connection with the angling community that biodiversity is important because we've got all this habitat, we've got all this biodiversity, you've got more places to fish, more fish to catch, and it's something worth protecting, and you can, uh, you can count them in as, as advocates. All right. All right, excellent. Okay, Valerie, do you wanna? Oh, thank you, Shannon. It's very hard to follow Chris because he's got all the numbers in his head, but I think he makes the point that I wanna make, and I think in some ways it is a bit of a controversial point, is that it's not about knowing the value about knowing the price. Because we always talk about value, but value is what something is worth. Price is what someone is willing to pay for it. And truth is, and I work for the World Bank, and our mission is to create a world without poverty. And we know we're never gonna have a world without poverty in a world without a livable planet, and we're never gonna have a livable planet in a world without a healthy ocean. So part of our mandate is to figure out how to keep the parts of the ocean that are healthy healthy, and how to restore the parts that are not. And what we found is you can do all the valuation in the world and it rarely moves the dial on decision making. And this is blasphemous. And I know there are folks back home across the road in the World Bank listening to this and I'll probably be fired. We're an institution of economists who do valuations and we have done them. We did a report a few years ago called the Sunken Billions Revisited to look at the foregone revenue that countries lose because they're mismanaging their fisheries. And it was $83 billion a year using 2012 prices. That's almost half 
of the global flows of overseas development assistance. So it's a huge amount of money. We've looked at mangroves. We're very good at valuing mangroves. We know that in Jamaica, for example, uh, per hectare per year, there is a value of $2,500 in flood protection benefits. It has not stopped mangrove destruction. We know that mangroves globally protect 6 million people from flooding. Hasn't stopped mangrove destruction. Because the truth is, this is all about valuation. And valuation very rarely gets translated into decision making. But price does. It's the difference in some ways between economics and finance. It's about where the money can go. And we can't pretend that those aren't hard choices. I mean, you look today and we talk to governments and there's a big push on the 30 by 30. We all agree with it. But I also agree with Jane that we need to look at the full 100% of the ocean, not the, just the 30% we want to put into national parks, too many of which will become paper parks. We need to learn our lesson. But for a lot of governments in the countries we work in developing countries, it's not so easy, no matter how much you can tell them about the value of the ocean. The value of mangrove-fed species, for example, in Indonesia. It's over 55% of the value of their fisheries. But they also have to think about all the other priorities. Just to take an extreme example, in the developing countries I work, we work in, 70% of 10-year-olds are functionally illiterate because of COVID learning losses. So 7 out of 10 10-year-olds 10 can't read and write. So when a government is making a decision as to how it's going to finance protect, marine protected areas, for example, it's not that they have no money. It's not that they don't care. It's not that they don't understand the value. But the price may not be the right price. And that's why, for us, we think it's critical to do marine spatial planning. You've heard about it from several people today, because that's where you negotiate price. That's where you really look and decide what price, who has to pay that price, and who are going to be the winners and the losers. That's where you get beyond the abstract discussion of value. But I think there's two things that are missing when it comes to marine spatial planning that we really have to push further. The first is data and metrics. Again, you've heard it today. Under Secretary Stofan mentioned it this morning, we don't have metrics and data. One of the reasons we talk about 30 by 30 is because in some ways it's a lazy metric. You declare your marine protected area, you declare success, do you actually put a penny against it? Do you measure it? Is the biodiversity healthier? In most places, we don't know. We need better data and metrics, because without metrics, you can't move money. SDG 14, Life Underwater, is the least funded SDG of all the SDGs. To get to the goals by 2030 is going to require $175 billion a year. To date, there's been less than $10 billion a year spent against it. Why? In part, because when people are assessing how to spend scarce overseas development assistance or scarce philanthropic capital, there's no way to measure the bang for their buck because we don't have a metric. So it's the first thing that's missing. We're really grateful for the emerging partnership we have with the Smithsonian, with NOAA, really trying to figure this out. The second thing that's missing is inclusion. Because if we don't have all the voices at the table, particularly the voices of communities, of micro and small businesses, then their interests are on the menu and they're going to be chewed up and spit out. And we have to make sure that we take into account in marine spatial planning not just modern science and new technologies, but traditional practices and indigenous knowledge. Because that's how we get to real inclusion. That's how we do proper marine spatial planning, where we negotiate price, and that's when we'll actually turn value into something that's meaningful. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. Yeah. Well Wow. <laughs> Can I just, I mean, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge um, the, the panelists here um, and so far the, the response to this question around value. My name is Joel Johnson and I'm the CEO and president of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. And uh, I am relatively new in the role, having spent a background at places like the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation and Trout Unlimited. So I kind of understand both the science um, objectives here, measurement and so forth, as well as the sort of need to root everything within a local community, like anglers, for example. Um, 
there are 15 national marine sanctuaries, a couple of national marine monuments, excuse me, it's probably, it says pick up my daughter, is what that says. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we are, as you know, the Biden-Harris administration is on a, a very ambitious goal to create a lot more national marine sanctuaries. There's six now in the inventory. And um, when I was contemplating this question about how can you figure out the true value of, of biodiversity, I kind of went back to what I've learned in the last few months working at the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, and that sanctuaries are people. They're not just, you know, they're, they're dots on a line, they're, they're, they're marine spatial mapping, they're the summation of countless hours of negotiations with, between local communities, governments, federal government. But at the end of the day, they're people, people making decisions to protect and steward the areas that they love, the nature, the coastlines, the waves, the water, the species, the whales. And Again, contemplating this question, I thought immediately about how someone in one of those sanctuaries might answer that question, like the Hawaiian Islands Humpback National Marine Sanctuary, which is ostensibly created to protect and to conserve that species. And for them, the answer is, you're asking me to value a family member, Kanaloa. Kanaloa is the, is the name for the Humpback Island to a native Hawaiian, and it's a, it's a sibling. If you start to talk to other people in sanctuaries, uh, you'll get other answers like, well, we are all born of coral reef polyps. We all come from the ocean. You're, you're asking me to value my family. You're asking me to value my ancestors. But then if we want to talk, how do we take action today? Well. I think it starts with making sure we, of course, have the correct EBVs, the right essential biodiversity variables for marine habitat that absolutely should guide the process of creating more marine protected areas. But that's one set of metrics and figures. We also need to not be lazy. We need to have the conversations with the socioeconomic experts who can talk about other valuations, other values you know, human values, value of pride, for example, place, purpose, uh, community. And we need to not be lazy and bring that into our conversation. So I challenge us as we think about this incredible momentum we have in terms of creating a national marine biodiversity strategy to ensure that we also bring a spirit of inclusiveness to this this, this effort and ensure that we are bringing in other voices into that conversation who can talk about other areas of value. When I first started at the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, on my first few days were the hottest on planet Earth. The first conversations I had with my staff, some of them were in tears because in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, they were watching projects that they had invested half a dozen years die in front of their eyes based on coral bleaching. And we know that's going to happen again this year because we're in the second year of a large El Nino. But I can tell you that coral reefs and Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary contributes $4.4 billion to the economy of Florida because that study was created at the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation a few years ago. And I want to give a shout out to my predecessor, Chris Sari, the former CEO and president of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation for working closely with Pew and Linfest and Smithsonian on the team that early days pushed for a National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, uh, National Marine Sanctuary Strategy. Um, excuse me, a National Marine Biodiversity Strategy. It's a lot of acronyms. <laughs> uh, so again, to question the value, and you know, I want to just bring that a little bit forward to the notion of um, inclusiveness. So as we look ahead and we have a lot of work to do, we, we have a choice. We can pick each other apart. We can find a lot of reasons to disagree. We can acknowledge the truth that marine protected areas in general as overall strategy, it's okay. It has challenges, but it's part of a larger strategy that involves people involves communities, involves sustainable livelihoods. All those maybe 
underscored important essential biodiversity values um, that we need to incorporate into our work to be more successful. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Kevin. All right. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here and to be on stage here. Uh, I also want to thank Nick Pyanson, one of the curators here. Uh, these shoes are his because my shoes, my jacket, and a very loud seahorse shirt are all currently somewhere in the Baltimore airport. Um, <laughs> So my name is Kevin Webb. I am one of the co-founders of Superorganism. I think I'm a little unusual on this stage. I, uh, Superorganism is the first venture capital firm to be dedicated entirely to biodiversity. Um, and that makes me a little unusual in a conservation space and in a venture capital space. Uh, because I'm talking with scientists and policymakers, quick refresher on what a venture capital firm does. Uh, we are looking for a range of startups, uh, so in our case about 30, uh, to make investments in, and they are all high risk, high reward. So hopefully delivering outsized economic returns, and in our case, also hopefully outsized ecologic returns. Um, so this question of how do you value biodiversity comes up quite a bit. Um, and what I would say is unique and exciting about this time is there is a delta between where biodiversity should be valued and where it presently is, but there are actually a lot of mechanisms that are starting to come online to get us at least a little bit closer to where biodiversity should be valued, right? 55% of global GDP is dependent on nature in some way, shape, or form. 2.7 billion people depend on nature in some way, shape, or form for daily sustenance. Uh, and then to top it off, we still have people who are making so-called rational decisions to deforest or overfish or pollute. And so the question is, how do we make the people who are in those decision-making positions um, have the ability to make the, the better ecological choice? Uh, and so just a few things I would point out. Uh, one is I think climate has paved an incredible path for nature right now. Uh, so as we have rediscovered that it turns out nature is really connected to our carbon cycle, there are economic cases to be made for seagrass, seaweed, forests, uh, all across the economy. Uh, second thing I'd point out is that uh, we have new regulations that are starting to come online that are asking companies to account for their nature impacts throughout their supply chains. Now, that's largely driven in ter more terrestrial systems right now. E uh, the EU is kind of leading the way there, but hopefully people in this room can make some headway there too. Um, but CSRD, EUDR, they're worth checking out if you don't already know about them. Um, and then... You know, what I'm really excited to see as those things come online is, does that result in ESG and consumer pressure? You know, when you have visibility into where do the products that I use come from, what were the environmental impacts on, on places and people, uh, as that becomes more visible thanks to technology and policy, um, do different choices get made? So to dial it back, how do you become a VC firm focused on biodiversity in a world where biodiversity is still categorically undervalued? Our view is that nature, much like climate change, cuts across the whole economy. And so our approach is very holistic. So we look at the companies that touch extinction drivers, so pollution, invasive species, habitat loss, over-exploitation. Anytime a startup is using new technologies and new approaches to disrupt or to help companies uh, transition to better practices, that's right up our alley. Second big theme is going back to climate change, so specifically the overlap between climate and nature. So we look a lot at technology that can help on nature-based solutions. Uh, we look a lot at adaptation, so where can nature help us deal with baked-in climate change. Uh, and then we also spend a lot of time thinking about how do we make a net zero transition in a way where we are also not compromising on nature. Uh, and then finally, we do a lot in enabling technology. So looking at things like AI, genomics, satellites, where conservationists can use it, but they don't have to be the entire audience. And then we try to figure out how to Robin Hood it into their hands a lot more cheaply as, as the businesses go after larger, deeper pockets. So that's us. Some of the things that we're doing in terms of evaluating these companies, we're making sure to work with scientists. We believe very strongly that it's necessary to bridge the worlds of conservation and technology. We believe that we are a slice of a much, much bigger, uh, broader movement. And so I'm here to learn. I'm really grateful for the time. Fantastic. That's wonderful. Well, thank, thank you all uh, for those introductory remarks and thoughts and for answering our question. I'm going to open it up shortly uh, to the audience for questions. So start thinking of them if you haven't already. Checking in with you all over there. Good. Um, 
let me just sort of recap a little bit of kind of what, what I thought I heard and, and, and tell me what I've missed. Um, so I heard first that biodiversity is, is by many a uh, perhaps poorly understood and even misunderstood term, that it's a science-y term that may not be resonating with even uh, really important constituencies like users of the ocean ecosystem and um, that we need to keep that in mind and think about it. I will say that in, in, my, in my team, I've taken to referring to this work and to the work that we do as simply um, work to just saving life on Earth. That's what we. That's what we talk. It's, it's really nothing short of life on Earth. Um, light, it, it, there's more than one fish species on, <laughs> um, on Earth, and so, um, so that's one point. You. I also heard it's a sort of everything needs to be on the table when we're we're trying to respond to the needs of biodiversity. Everything needs to be on the table. That made me think about. President Biden's th approach to 30 by 30, he didn't just give us a mission, he told us how to do it. It's not just a mission, it's the method. He said, community-led, voluntary, it's gotta you know, come from community with community, and all everything's on the table. So in a terrestrial sense, for example, that means working lands. How can we you know, improve working lands contributions to biodiversity, private, private lands, for example, uh, tribal lands and the like. I heard it's about price, not value. Uh, wonderful, wonderful way to think about it. Marine spatial planning is the way the World Bank is looking at it. Um, we've got missing data and metrics. Uh, big time missing, I heard from several, uh, is this question of inclusion. How do we make sure that communities are at the table, um, micro and small businesses, indigenous voices. We heard that in the last panel, obviously, as well. Sanctuaries are people, I love that. I think that's, that's great. Um, and uh, that we need to be looking for metrics that go beyond kind of the, easy, the easier metrics to think about. Um, I also wanna say, you know, when it comes to metrics that again, talking about 30 by 30, you know, protected areas are, are one tool in the toolbox, but, but we've got a big toolbox and it's not just protected areas. It's, 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 other, it's other mechanisms too um, for getting to even those high level goals. And then nature cr cuts across the economy. Um, and I think that that's a really uh, great way to think about it. And I think Kevin, you bring just such a fresh um, perspective to this conversation and, um, and an imaginative and uh, really forward looking um, approach to addressing it, so thank you. All right, so with that, I'm gonna look at my timekeepers. Can we go to questions? Yes, good, very good. All right, hands up, we have a microphone moving around the room. Okay, thanks, please introduce yourself. Hello, ooh, loud. Hello, um, my name is Lauren Swadell. I am Chamorro from the island of Guam. That's where I earned my master's of uh, science and environmental science, focusing on watershed restoration. I now work at Pew Charitable Trust, focusing on Pacific marine protected areas and trying to be very inclusive of community-driven um, efforts. So my question to the panel is, how can um, we be integrating communities and incorporate indigenous knowledge in a way that is indigenous-led and not sort of, you know, an external like effort that is maybe uh, pushing forward an external agenda. Thank you. Who wants to take that one on? Oh, I kind of feel like <laughs> I, should, uh, I should say something. Uh, so um, thank you for your question. I think that was a great one. And uh, you know, I, I could use the illustration. Well, actually, let me use an illustration for, for everyone in the room because they may not know about one of the proposed National Marine Sanctuaries, which kind of gives us a little bit of insight, I think which is the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. So um, it's not been, it has not been formally designated yet. It's in its, in its, it's, in its nomination, uh, it's past its nomination phase and it is being considered. So uh, this is the first indigenous led National Marine Sanctuary. Um, however, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is the first time that tribal nations or indigenous people have been involved in either the direct creation or management of a sanctuary. There are lots of different roles and lots of different ways to do that, uh, either through, for example, the Sanctuary Advisory Committee, which is a committee of people made up from the local community that might be involved in creating what is the most crucial or critical document in a national marine sanctuary, which is the management plan. And um, the reality is, is that 
each one of the sanctuaries has a very unique composition, if you will. Um, and so the sanctuary system then, in my opinion, demands um, at least, I think, at least a unique approach to, um, to both to managing it and also in the creation of, as well as in protecting the, um, the interests of the local communities that are part of that process. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said before, sanctuaries are people. So we are challenged to um, educate people, ourselves, on the process of the creation of a marine protected area in general. Ensure that the community has a deep understanding of that process and is involved in that process. And in general here, I probably could ask folks to raise their hand and ask, even within this very educated and literate room, I'm sure there are some people who have never, don't, you can admit, you don't have to admit it, who probably never heard of a national marine sanctuary. I'm sure there are some. And the fact of the matter is, um, we suffer across the entire nation with a very low awareness of that. And that low awareness contributes to a, that lack of understanding. So, you know, we at the foundation in particular, we see it as our job to help amplify and leverage and you know, lift up uh, a deeper understanding of the value of these sanctuaries and to help bridge that divide, close that gap, and then ensure that there is in true engagement in the, in the public process. Um, one of the strengths of the sanctuary system is that it is driven by a public process. There really aren't too many more examples out there of the creation of public lands that have that as part of it. Um, and so in that way, it's also, again, unique. In terms of the larger agendas, when you talked about externalities, like 30 by 30 and other presidential directives that might come down, unlike the Antiquities Act, this is a, you know, in the, the creation of a sanctuary is one that really very specifically involves the local community. They have to want it. And in most cases, for those of you who don't know, a sanctuary is nominated by a local community and then evaluated over time by NOAA and other um, regulatory bodies to see if it's the right fit to create one. That, again, is another strength of that process and a unique attribute to it, which I think creates opportunity. Now, would I call that today equity? I think we're on a journey. <laughs> we are on a journey to get there. But one thing that comes out of the process each and every time is growth. And growth is critical. Learning in that process how to improve the creation of sanctuaries moving forward or other marine protected areas, creating national visibility such as Shumash has done. You know, there's a strong coalition that have brought together a lot of NGOs, state and federal partners to help raise the visibility of that process. And that's been very, very critical to, that, to, the, to, to, the, to the creation of sanctuaries. And ultimately, I think, will benefit the future creation of sanctuaries that involve tribal nations or indigenous peoples. There's a bit of a roadmap Great. So. Great. Valerie, did you want to add something? Just very quickly, three things that we think about. One, there is no such thing as a local community. We make the mistake of thinking these are homogenous communities, and they're not. So remembering the heterogeneity and bringing in small and micro-sized businesses, bringing on and letting communities decide for themselves. That's the second most important thing, giving them the money and the time to choose their own representation. There's a lot of danger of elite capture and choosing people to represent communities that wouldn't be their choice. And I think that's something that we need to make sure. And the third thing is we have to make sure any process, any public process is AAA. It's available, people know where it is, where it's happening. It's accessible, it's done in a way and in a language that local communities can access, and it's affordable. We have to make sure that everybody can actually participate, and it's not going to take real money out of their pocket, and they have to make that trade-off between putting food on the table or expanding their business or going being part of that public process. And then, I'm sorry, was that one minute for Q&A? Oh, dear me. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay, let's get to another question. We have one more question. Oh, no. Oh, yes. We, okay. Hi, thank you. This is Jeff Waters with Ocean Conservancy. Um, I want to talk about the, ask about the money real quick. So the Inflation Reduction Act is phenomenal in that it is using all sorts of money and incentives and 
uh, mechanisms to try to transition away from the fossil fuel economy and towards a clean energy economy. What could the biodiversity equivalent look like? If you had the pen to write a package to restructure our economy to focus on nature-based infrastructure and all the things that support biodiversity, what would you invest in? All right, in 15 seconds or less. That's the answer to that question. <laughs> Look at the subsidies reform in the WTO. The package of fisheries subsidy reform is how you begin to fix fisheries because you affect somebody's trade, they're gonna make those decisions at home that help rebuild that renewable natural capital. Excellent answer, Kevin. I was also gonna start with subsidies. This is me cheating. Um, but. I would also look at project development capital. Uh, so as different technologies and approaches scale to help us reach 30 by 30, uh, where those fit in, making sure that we've got later stage capital that's able to be deployed in these types of projects and startups and approaches. All right, I am so sad that we are out of time. Um, I wanna first thank the panelists. I, I also wanna say um, to the panel before us and to, to answer, to respond to your question, you know, our secretary is the first Native American cabinet member and she's teaching us <laughs> amen and um, she's teaching us a lot about how to engage indigenous communities and her her watchword that she says over and over and over again is listen and at listen and we can hold public meetings we can invite people to public meetings we can and they can come and they and sometimes I feel particularly in government and in other institutional arrangements and settings we're not hearing we're not listening with ears that are sensitive not just to to not just different knowledge but to do to different knowledge systems the speaker that was on the previous panel when she talked about our knowledge system being tied to our native language that's real and um, i think we all have to learn how to listen differently um, okay sorry i couldn't help it uh, thank you to everyone in this room to your panelists and for everything that you're doing to save life on Earth. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, and everyone on the panel. <clears throat> I'm sure we could have an entirely new panel just on the last question that was asked. No, no doubt everyone in the room has thoughts about that. But for now, uh, we'll move on. Maybe that's next time. Um, so. We, we've heard a lot about uh, already about new ways to approach some of the problems, some of the challenges that we face with living nature and climate and the connection among them. Uh, I'm really happy that the current panel, the next panel, uh, is focusing specifically on that issue, uh, innovation in how we approach these challenges. Uh, for conservation in the blue economy, uh, the panel will explore um, opportunities for innovation, but importantly, uh, it, we take a broad view of innovation. So not just technology, science, and so on, but uh, t innovation in policy and governance. We heard um, just now from Kevin about innovation in, in uh, uh, investing in venture capital. So uh, please welcome uh, Sean Congrove, Sean Cosgrove, sorry, Sean, as our moderator, uh, program officer for marine conservation at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And would like to ask all of uh, the panelists to come to the stage. Thank you. Great. Isn't this great? This has been a really awesome day. These two previous panels have set a pretty high bar, so we're just going to totally quit now and go out and start the reception early. Um, my name is Sean Cosgrove I'm with the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. I'm with the Marine Conservation Initiative. So for many of you scientists, I'm not going to fund you. You have to talk to the science program. All right. Um, so Emmett did an introduction of what the panel is about, exploration and innovation in, to sustain and conserve biodiversity. Uh, a number of these themes have been brought up several times today. I'm not gonna go through them again. 
But let me just say, it, this uh, whole area of innovation and, ex and uh, developing new mechanisms, new machines, new tools, new software, ways of engaging people, ways of developing new approaches to law, policy, government, and governance. These are all the things that are in front of us. So we have experts from all these different fields. And um, we're going to start out. Let me tell you who you're looking at here. Um, first of all, this is Dylan McDowell. Raise your hand, Dylan. Um, Janet Coit there. Peter Gerges with the hat. Chris Meyer and Angelo Villa Gomez. OK, there's our panels. They're going to introduce themselves while they answer this question. What new advances are needed across fields of work, science, technology, policy, governance, to bring us to a sustainable relationship with nature? Five minutes or less. Who wants to go first? Go ahead. All right, I'll kick it off. Uh, I'm Dylan McDowell. I'm the executive director of the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators. We're a nationwide network of about 1,400 state lawmakers across the US. Um, thank you to the Smithsonian and for NOAA for putting this on. Many, many years ago, I was an intern at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, and I have fond memories of driving a 16-passenger van of middle schoolers to this museum. Um, so it's great to be back here for work, uh, but even better to be with folks that can sit still for 45 minutes. So thank you. Um, <laughs> Our organization, as I mentioned, we work with state lawmakers. We are a network. Uh, we don't lobby, but we help connect them with the best resources, with each other, um, figure out how do they make the strongest environmental policy possible. And I like to just take a moment to highlight how the state governments differ from the federal governments for folks that maybe aren't familiar. As a whole, state legislatures are under-resourced, they're understaffed. If you're in states like New Mexico, you don't get paid to be a legislator. If you're in Rhode Island or New Hampshire, unless you're in leadership, you don't have an office to go to. If you're in states like Nevada or Texas, you only meet every other year to make policy. Um, if you're in states like Georgia or Indiana, you have to share one staffer amongst three to five legislators. So imagine managing your own schedule, let alone five people's. And so those conditions make it very hard, yet we see so much action at the state level, and especially action that leads to ocean protection and really can spur federal action. Recent examples include um, when there was a proposal to expand offshore drilling. You had 10 states either do bans or restrictions on offshore drilling in their waters. You had over 20 states do microbead uh, bans once it was found to be harmful in personal care products, and then Congress passed a nation-leading ban to really standardize things. You have more than nine states have policies on 30 by 30 protection, either at the executive level or the state level. And you have states like Vermont that are going so far to say 50 by 50. So 30 by 30 wasn't enough. We're going to do Maryland proposed 40 by 40, and Vermont said, not good enough. Let's go 50 by 50. And that is the innovation that happens at the state level. You get one state try something, and then you can, you can replicate, you can learn, you can share. And that's what we try and do is share across those state lines. We also have states pushing um, more than 365 legislators signed on for a national biodiversity strategy onto a sign-on letter, so trying to call for that federal action. And so my ultimate pitch here is to really, we, it's so important to work at the local level, so important to work federally, internationally, but don't forget about these state legislators because they are really trying to figure out how to make these solutions. Even if they don't have a staff, all these resources, we're seeing some really neat opportunities right now on the ocean front. Thinking about things like kelp and, and eelgrass protection, states like Washington are working on that. Meanwhile, Florida and Maine are looking at working waterfronts and blue economy. So we have a real connection here where you can think about blue carbon ecosystems as a workforce development for jobs, for kelp farming, regenerative ocean agriculture. But it also creates local buffering for climate change, thinking about ocean acidification. More than seven states have active ocean acidification panels and coastal hazards where they're really trying to figure out how do we turn all of this research and monitoring into policy. And then the final piece that I would just say is there is a really growing and very necessary movement to better include indigenous, and tribal, indigenous communities and tribal nations. We are doing a lot of work to try and figure out as an organization how we can bring tribal leaders into the conversation and help state legislators understand those points of, of, of connection. Um, we're seeing exciting things. Places like Maine have really stand, streamlined and improved their offshore wind permitting process where um, a, a tribal member is part of the advisory board and they've moved up tribal consultation much earlier in the process. There's places like Washington where they're trying to make better inroads and really give um, more uh, veto power in certain instances. Places like 
like Minnesota have right of first refusal that really lead into land back processes where you can give, give land back and try and encourage stewardship by native communities. And so there's some really exciting and promising opportunities here, both in how do you tie climate and ocean and economics together, and then also how do we include indigenous communities to be the leaders. So I'll stop there and pass it on to you. My Go get him, Pete. All yeah. right, just checking with the boss. Right. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation, and thank you all for your time and attention. My name is Pete Gerges. Uh, I'm a professor at Harvard University. I'm a marine scientist. A lot of my work really focuses on understanding our, like how the deep sea works. How do the animals and microbes make a living down there, and what happens, and how does that relate to the rest of the ocean system? And what I've learned over the course of my career is that there is no, um, uh, there's, there's no part of our ocean that doesn't influence our daily lives. That's the deal. And I'd be happy to nerd out and tell you all about the data if you want to hear it. But at the end of the day, it's been astonishing and absolutely wondrous uh, to have the privilege to sail around the world and study underwater volcanoes and hot springs and the underwater ecosystems that where, where we see amazing, extraordinary organisms that are really part of the engine of our biosphere and kind of help keep our planet running. And so I would love to tell you about all of those stories today, but I really wanted to focus on this question of innovation. Like, what do we need to do to really build a healthier, more sustainable relationship with the ocean? And I want to start w by underscoring that innovation isn't just technology. It's also innovating the way we work with one another, our sort of structural and cultural uh, approaches to engaging with one another and working together towards uh, a more sustainable relationship with the ocean. And I, w I wanted to highlight just a few particular points that, that I think are, are, are worth our, our uh, consideration here. So. Um, one of the things is over the years, I've had a, an opportunity to work with many, many different kinds of entities. I've been funded by federal agencies, a, a number of federal agencies. I've had the privilege of working with philanthropic entities that support research on the high seas. They send us off into the farthest corners, if there are corners on around world, but they send us off to the farthest reaches of the planet to do things that, that the federal agencies are, are simply not in a position to do had the privilege of working with the United Nations on developing the High Seas Treaty and so on and so forth. And what I've learned in that time is that all of these entities have something really important and unique to bring to the table as we think about better understanding and protecting the ocean. But they do not always have a chance to work together. There are a lot of barriers that stand between different entities collaborating towards a common goal. I've been on expeditions which uh, were funded by a philanthropic entity. Uh, and I've tried to say, hey, can I ask my federal agency to allow me to use funds to do work with that philanthropic entity, or can we somehow formalize a relationship? And it's, it's been a real challenge. Uh, getting agencies to work together, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, that is another challenge. And I think when you're trying to understand and support the world's largest you know, uh, habitat, right, the world's largest feature, you can't do this in a stovepipe siloed manner. So I really think that focusing on overcoming some of those structural barriers is really, really key. I also think that when we invite folks uh, to the table, we really need to focus on inviting folks from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, really to contribute towards building this better relationship with the ocean. You know, one of the things about being uh, 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 an academic is, you know, I could, it's really easy to just kind of hide in your lab and do your work. Uh, one of the things that's been incredibly powerful is sailing with folks who aren't academics or engaging with um, government representatives as I work in a nation's um, sovereign waters, right, in their EEZ, and learning about different approaches and perspectives on the ocean. You know, scientists, I mean, at the risk of sounding immodest, we have a lot to offer to the conversation, um, but we are not the sole keepers of knowledge or understanding, right? And local communities, indigenous communities, government representatives, industry partners, philanth philanthropists all have something important to bring to the table, and I would strongly encourage us to base our decisions on what we hear from everybody, right? Um, you know, we often talk about, let's make sure we make decisions that are rooted in science, but I would extend that to say, let's make sure that we make decisions with science and partnership with all stakeholders. 
And I think one of the things that I, I have found really, really works well is to just be constantly curious. And I have the privilege of, of, of having a career that encourages that. But when you're really curious and you're willing to listen to folks, uh, even if, even if um, they, are, they, are, they are coming from a different perspective, actually, especially if they're coming from a different perspective, you'll learn something you may not have learned before. And I have dozens of examples of how you know, my research in the deep sea was really bolstered by someone who said, oh, you know what, I, I've been a fisher person and I've been um, you know, studying this area for I don't know how many years. And um, then using that to, to really engage with them and have them kind of continue our work. So at the end of the day, I think we heard Jane say this, that you know, we ought to really try to reimagine our relationship with the ocean because it isn't just this big expanse of water that divides us, but quite literally, it's what connects us to one another. And so let's, uh, let's work on innovation across technology, uh, culture, uh, and our uh, sort of uh, structural relationships. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Pete. Janet, would you like to go next? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Janet Coit. I'm the head of the National Marine Fisheries Service. And I wanted to start out by saying you are preaching to the choir in that uh, I work very closely with my colleagues from the State Department, from the Interior Department, from the Smithsonian, um, and uh, certainly as a federal family, um, Dr. Lebchenko and others, uh, we very much are excited to participate in this. I wanted to start by acknowledging the other panelists who were um, amazing. Um, I think one of the important things that, as you said, is hearing other perspectives and really connecting your head with your heart at, in these occasions um, when we get together uh, to talk about biodiversity and saving life on Earth. Um, I also wanted to mention that I spent the 10 years before this job uh, working at the state level. To your comments totally resonate with me um, and working with states and tribes and, um, and I won't say communities in some sort of generic um, homogenous way, uh, but communities who know what they care about um, and what they want uh, is key to doing all of this work. And I think we are somewhat hampered by bureaucracies that take some time um, to learn and navigate. We were just joking about acronyms. Um, so, uh, you know, being together um, as people is where it all starts. <sighs> There's a lot here I want to say. Um, first, just um, for those who don't know NOAA Fisheries, um, our authorities are extend three to 200 miles um, for uh, stewardship of living marine resources. And if that's not an awesome responsibility, um, I don't know what is. I mean, that is an area bigger than the um, contiguous land area of the United States. Um, and obviously, it's so different um, in Guam um, from the Caribbean, from Maine, from Alaska. Uh, so our work around uh, sustainable fisheries, protected resources, uh, ensuring safe seafood necessitates um, that we work uh, with states, tribes, communities on um, the fisheries and the habitats and the resources that they understand and that they care about. As we talk about climate change, I just, I'm not sure I've heard this mentioned, last year was the hottest year on record by far. Um, and I think we did hear mention the waters, um, you know, buoys off the coast of Florida measured waters at 100 degrees, you know, the same as the, the bathtub you climb into on a cold winter day. Um, we are seeing sh dramatic shifts in stocks. Um, I am from Rhode Island. Thanks for mentioning Rhode Island. Uh, but we were uh, able to witness, and I really first heard this from the fishermen um, out on the water, recreational and commercial fishermen, these tremendous um, shifts in what they were landing. Uh, lobsters have all but left Narragansett Bay due to warming waters. Um, even our lobstermen who are going offshore are often catching more Jonah crab than lobster. As that species moves um, north and east, they'll be fine. <laughs> They're just not going to be where they were. And we're seeing that with many, many species um, that are shifting. So I wanted that to be a, a back drop or a foundation for talking about some innovations. Um, and, and there's many. I, I chose to talk a little bit more about technologies, but want to also say that um, having more representation at the table where decisions are made um, on, on environmental justice and equity strategy in line with the president's executive order also requires us to innovate and do things very differently. Um, and we're, we have a lot of humility there and are trying to do that work um, through listening. Um, 
but we need to better understand what's happening in the ocean, um, the non-stationarity that means that we can't expect things to act the way they have in the past, um, means that our management regimes and our management approaches are often out of sync with what's actually going on. Um, so I think it was um, Colleen who mentioned um, the crab crash, which has been tied to, in the, um, in the Bering Sea, to marine heat waves. Um, the salmon that aren't coming back to the Arctic and the Yukon and the Kuskokwim rivers that has been tied um, primarily to changes in the ocean and predator prey being out of sync. We're seeing that with North Atlantic right whales that are following their prey into areas that are putting them more in the line of fire when it comes to vessel strikes and entanglement. Um, so what we need to do, among other things, is invest in more technologies um, that can allow us to understand these changes and then work with managers to implement management regimes and tools um, that will keep up with the ecosystem changes and that will ensure that we're planning ahead um, to make sure um, that we're not um, keeping uh, quotas and allocations and systems that were based on history that is either um, re repressive or no longer applies because of the way the ecosystem has changed. Um, so things like omics, which you know a lot about, um, looking at the molecular level, we've been um, using eDNA and can much more quickly um, see what's happening with the energy in the ocean and the presence and absence of species. Um, one of the things we love to do is work with the fishing community. Um, we've been able to put uh, cameras on small boats, first in the Pacific Islands, um, now in other parts in the Gulf of Maine, other uh, Gulf of Mexico, other parts of the world, and then use um, a, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to quickly understand, you know, without dragging a net through the water, um, what is in the ecosystem. And I see that I'm out of time, um, um, but some some of these um, technologies, we um, talked about melting ice. Um, the, the ice loss in the Antarctic was the most pronounced it's ever been before last year. And we're seeing both um, protected species and uh, fisheries affected by things like melting ice. And so we need to understand it better. We need to predict it. And then we need to make sure that we are nimble enough to use those tools to change our approach to management. And I will stop there, um, though I'd like to talk more. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll give you a chance later on. All right, Chris Meyer. Thanks, uh, Janet. You introduced uh, eDNA. So I, my name's Chris Meyer. I'm, I'm actually here at the building. I, I pretty much live here. Um, I'm a curator and research zoologist in invertebrate zoology, and uh, I'm pretty much a biodiversity accountant. That's my job. That my job's to be the biodiversity accountant to go out and measure and, and document life on the planet. So. Um, and generally, as we talked about, biodiversity monitoring is hard, especially in the ocean, right? So it requires that taxonomic expertise. Um, you know, it's often invasive or, or disruptive. And you mentioned uh, eDNA. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advocate hard on that as a new technology right now. Um, so to address your question about, you know, what's needed to advance those efforts towards a more sustainable relationship, I mean, biomolecular monitoring promises, is one of the only technologies that's going to promise to scale to that challenge to deliver repeatable metrics of ocean life. And, and I'm just going to advocate and talk about um, the efforts to advance the adoption and impl implementation of biomolecular observations. And, and you can just kind of treat that as eDNA, shed particles. We all thank, thank it, since we went through COVID and the pandemic, we all know the power of that technology and how we globally mobilized um, suites of, of information systems, sampling systems, and it actually works. You know, it's, it's like smelling the skunk as you're driving down the road. It's uh, time averaged and it sits there. So, um, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna run through really quickly um, global efforts and then work down through uh, state efforts and what we're doing here at the Natural History Museum to de uniquely deliver on the needs of, of, of this emerging technology moving forward. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna highlight uh, so you know about it is there's a newly, at the international level, because I, I love putting together teams and people, the diversity of people and the challenges there, I, I find one of the most fascinating parts of, of what I do too, in, in addition to being out there in the natural world and documenting it. So there's a, a newly uh, launched omic bond, which sits within the geobond of the group of, on Earth observatories that was just launched in Montreal uh, this past fall. And that group, um, is, its mission is to improve the acquisition, coordination, and delivery of biodiversity observations and related services to users, including decision makers and the scientific community. That's led, co-led by Raisa Meyer, Pierre Buttigieg, and Neil Davies. And it's all about cooperation, intercalibration, standardization, harmonization, 
Um, we want to promote the alignment of the cyber infrastructure to support this global endeavor. And we also want to raise the awareness of the societal impl implica implement implications, so ethical, legal, and, and policy domains, data sovereignty, and such. Um, secondly, highlighting at the international level, there's the OBON, or the Ocean Biomolecular Observing Network. That's an endorsed program by the UN Decade of the Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Um, they want to monitor, research, and understand ocean life by analyzing biomolecules. Again, the goals of that is to build a coastal to open ocean multi-omics biodiversity observing system over the course of this ocean decade by 2030. Um, they have similar goals, but their focus there is marine rather than omic bond is all domains, terrestrial, freshwater, and marine. Um, that that OBON effort's led by Margaret Leinen from Scripps, and it's been super active in COP and other international fora. On the national side, um, I've been co-chairing with Kelly Goodwin at NOAA and Michael Weiss at the Office of Naval Research, uh, the production of a national aquatic eDNA strategy. And we just put forth the final draft of that to the Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology for their review. Um, that, that was a really amazing endeavor to get interagency participation. I think we had 14 different agencies participating. We had over 100 different members from the federal community, as well as public input from over 400 comments through the RFI that closed in November. And the goal of that strategy is to harness the power of eDNA to explore, map, monitor, and better understand aquatic life to sustain and restore biological resources into the future, everything we're talking about here, right? So uh, the strategy is a call for action from federal agencies to enhance adoption of the methodologies through increased federal coordination, communication, absolutely critical there. Um, we need to build the human and technical capacity to support this entire research enterprise. And um, we need to employ that then technology at large scales to, to characterize uh, aquatic life in U.S. waters. You know, our target date for the re release of that strategy and the public rollout is the next National Marine eDNA Workshop. That's, um, we kind of tried to time it for the Capitol Hill Ocean Week, so that's the June 3rd through 5th. And we'll be co-hosting that with Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, so pay attention to that. And then finally, here at the Smithsonian and the Natural History Museum, um, we're launching a five-year initiative called Ocean DNA. Kirk mentioned that to provide uh, unique critical support for that, this endeavor, right? So um, the program fits within Ellen's um, talked about the Life on a Sustainable program, uh, Planet program because it provides that standardized, repeatable metrics of change to create those baselines and monitor the impact of activities towards sustainable biodiversity solutions. And again, that can scale. We can, we, everybody can do this and participate. Here at NMNH, we have the world's largest collections. Kirk mentioned them, turn around, and you can look at it, all the, uh, this a very small subset of what we've got. So we want to unlock those collections um, through new sequencing approaches to deliver that trusted, verifiable, voucher-based reference libraries across all the common markers that we're going to use. And we're also critically going to expand the concept of natural history collections to include environmental samples. We're gonna go beyond the specimens and actually capture the whole communities and archive those. We don't have time machines. We can't go back in time. And the number one thing I would say, like we can't wait for the perfect. Like we should be sampling these critical habitats and communities now. We need to have a national and international strategy to bio-archive this for questions we don't even know we should be asking in, in the future. But we, we have the wherewithal here and the curatorial um, uh, reputation to do that. And we're doing that with our interagency partners, with NOAA, with USGS, hey with BOEM. So hey very excited about this. So, um, and with that, I'm gonna there you go. move on. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. I don't know if you can see, she was like waving, like stop, I stop. I, I saw over. that. <laughs> All right. She's doing a great job back doing here. Doing a great job. I've, I've seen a lot of people taking notes. That's awesome. I hope you're also cogitating your questions. Um, we're gonna have audience questions after Angelo. So the most patient man on the panel. Best looking too, right? And oh, yeah. as what? Well. Best, best man yeah. bun. Yeah, best man bun. There's two were in the room. <laughs> the other one's over there. Um, Angelo Villa Gomez. Hey, it, it's actually gentlemen. scarier being up here than I thought it would be, looking at like this crew of like famous ocean people from across the country. Um, my name is Angelo. I work for an organization here in town called the Center for American Progress. Um, also, the ocean co-lead for a coalition called America the Beautiful for All, uh, which supports the dual Biden administration goals of protecting 30% of the ocean, um, but also meeting uh, Justice 40 to make sure that money is going to front lines. Uh, I am also Tremoro. 
tomorrow. And I, I want to thank the Smithsonian and Noah for inviting like two tomorrow bros uh, onto the same stage. Uh, that is so rare that that actually happens. Um, you may not know this, uh, but tomorrow's are the stewards of 10% of the United States exclusive economic zone, almost a million square kilometers around our waters, uh, the US waters. Uh, but I think there's five of us here. So at the next conference, I would like you to invite five more tomorrows uh, so that we actually achieve equity. Um, now, my, my, my thesis is that uh, we need uh, innovation of uh, the who and how of conservation, um, and I'm eventually going to get there, but I'm going to start with some audience participation. If you were from Hawaii or Alaska or the territories, Puerto Rico, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, can you just raise your hand? Four, five, hey, where, where are you from, Warren? Alaska, I did not know that. Uh, all right, like Puerto Rico in the house, Hawaii over here. Uh, the, the six people, seven people in the room uh, are stewards of 80% of the ocean in this country. Um, but the rest of you, uh, where uh, <laughs> stewards of 18% of the ocean are, are where the jobs are, are where the colleges are, and are where all the decision makers are. Uh, but the people who are raising their hands are the ones who have to live with the decisions that the people in this room are making. And, and so I, I just wanted to point that out to all of you. Uh, and that you, this is the right, I heard someone say earlier that this is, you are all the right people. And I, I wanna repeat that, you are all the right people, but we need a bigger room. So this room should be five times as big uh, and we need a lot more people. Ocean conservation has a demographic problem. Colonialism is one of the biggest problems we have in ocean conservation today. Um, there's organizations out there like Green 2.0, right? Um, and they, they collect data and they tell us how the NGOs are doing. And you know, over the course of 10 years, we've seen some increases um, and we've seen uh, uh, some st actually some stalling at the, at the highest levels of, of, of you know, just whether or not you're hiring black people. Are you hiring indigenous people? Are Hispanic, are, are Hispanic people working for these NGOs? Um, but we, the, the, the data hides a lot of the inequities that are actually happening. It, it, we saw some of this on the stage, and we're all going to go to ocean conferences this, this year. We're going to go to Our Ocean. I think there's something happening with the UN. There's Chow. Anytime that there is a panel and it's about outreach, education, equity, you find people who are gay, women, brown, and young. And they're the ones who are on this stage. Whenever it's a panel about leadership, if it's a panel about, about finance or, or technology, you get a bunch of old white guys. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll say, I, I work in ocean conservation. I worked in ocean conservation for 20 years. Uh, it just blows my mind. And th again, this is not a criticism of the Smithsonian. This is, a this is uh, data for our entire industry. It just blows my mind that we have a panel with only one woman on here talking about the future of ocean conservation. That guy one head not right. Um, so uh, that's that's the, we we have to fix the who of conservation. We need we need a bigger room. We need a bigger tent. We need to bring more more people in. And we and we've discussed uh, all of the great ways to do it. And it's just it's still it's important to say it today because in this country there is an anti woke movement on the other side of our country. There's an attack on DEI. And, if you, and I know you're tired of hearing about this. George Floyd was four years ago. We've been talking about diversity for four years. It was easy to talk about diversity four years ago. Right now, it's hard. I just got the one minute warning and I haven't even gotten to policy. <laughs> All right, so, so we, we have to fix the, the who of conservation and when we bring more people in the room, it's gonna change the how. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about indigenous people um, and if you've ever seen a movie, like a period piece with indigenous people, um, there's always like the white guy is the hero and he has like an indigenous friend. Um, there's, there's almost always like an, the, the bad guy is always like the other indigenous guy, <laughs> right? And the indigenous people are the ones who end up fighting and killing each other. And, and the same thing happens in conservation. You know, we're, we're seeing a little bit of this in Chumash and I'm not gonna speak to that. Um, I've seen it on my islands. Um, NOAA Fisheries gives money to the council. Interior and Pew gives money to people like me. And the indigenous people just yell and scream at each other. And you know, the, the, the bigger problem is, is that there's not enough 
people from the territories, there's not enough people from Hawaii and Alaska and where these ocean conservation initiatives are happening, they're not in leadership positions. And so the people who are trying to navigate these issues, they just don't have the knowledge of how to navigate these really difficult uh, issues that are tied to like identity and ownership and 500 years of colonialism. Now in 30 seconds, I'm gonna discuss policy. Um, I, I've worked on 30 by 30 for almost 30 years, going back to 2006 when Guam and Northern Mariana Islands committed to 30% near shore protections. Um, I was on a lot of the working groups. Um, I'm with America the Beautiful. Uh, when I worked for Pew, I actually wrote the resolution at the IUCN. So I, I am committed to 30 by 30, um, but I'm also very critical of 30 by 30. Uh, the major shortcomings of 30 by 30 are that we are ending up with a whole lot of protected areas that are poorly designed, poorly implemented, and unjust. Um, and I've got a couple papers coming out that throw some numbers behind that. Um, and, and we kind of need to fix that. You know, the United States is on the cusp of achieving 30 by 30. If you look at the protected areas, we've got about 26%. You look at some of our, our strong fisheries measures. At the end of the day, 30 by 30 is a political commitment, and if I was a betting man, the Biden administration is gonna come out this year, uh, probably at our ocean, probably at Capitol Hill Ocean Week, and they're gonna announce that the United States has achieved 30 by 30. But if you look under the surface, 99% of our MPAs are out in the Western Pacific. Um, I did a paper last week, 50% of those don't even have management plans. Um, Marion Trench and PRI were designated 15 years ago. Why don't we have management plans? Why aren't there more staff in the territories? Um, and I don't think we need to, we shouldn't throw those out. We actually need to make sure that those big protected areas work, but we've completely ignored the rest of the country. Less than 1% of the, the lower 48 is protected. Um, and so I think we need to go beyond 30 by 30. And we need to not focus so much, let's not get cut up, let's not get so caught up in what counts we need to focus on what we do next. And I've, I've got a few more notes, but I'm, we're about an hour away from happy hour. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna we'll hold back to that. that. We'll come back to that. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. All right, thank you. Uh, questions? Right here. That's the first hand I saw. Right. Thank you all for your comments. Um, I'm Allison Miller from the Schmidt Ocean Institute, and I wanted to revisit the word exploration in the panel title and ask each of you if we were going to narrow down where we explored either geographically or uh, vital ocean regions um, to help you get the data that you need to sustain ocean biodiversity, <laughs> where would you suggest exploring? So if we, Another way to put that, I guess, is if we took all of the advice you just gave us on the innovation portion, what is your advice for focusing efforts on the exploration portion of this? Well, I'll, I'll start just by um, uh, keying off of how much of the ocean are in the um, territories. Those are data poor compared to many other parts of the US, so I think both um, the Caribbean, the Pacific Islands, and then you know parts of the Bering Sea and areas um, where we have little uh, understanding of where the fish are going or um, where North Pacific right whales are. You know, so I think um, I would throw in um, Alaska too, particularly um, the Northern Bering Sea. Uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute has been to. Guam, um, you've been to the Mariana Trench, um, and you know, you've been pretty good about uh, stopping at our ports and letting folks on the island. Um, there's still a lot of parachute science that happens in the territories. Um, you know, NOAA was out in our waters a couple years ago, and they wouldn't let us anybody, they wouldn't let our people on the boat. And so the science, the scientists are all coming from Hawaii and the mainland, and they're answering questions that are important to Hawaii and the mainland, but they're not answering questions that are important to the territories because we're not we're not allowed even to be on the boat, um, but Schmidt's been great. Uh, um, even some of the exploration, um, you know, the, the, the dives that have been to the Mariana Trench, how, how is it that there's been 30 dives to the Mariana Trench, but nobody from the Mariana Islands has been invited on the boat? I'm not blaming you, that was somebody else. <laughs> yeah, and if I, I'll speak to that just briefly and say that, rather, um, uh, you're, you're asking sort of, where should we go? I, I, I think we should also ask, um, about expanding the definition of exploration. I think that philanthropic entities have a really unique opportunity uh, to support efforts in a really nimble way uh, 
uh, to really explore uh, the, you know, the, f the farthest reaches of our planet. So um, I have spent much of my career working with, with uh, you know, uh, uh, fishermen and fisherwomen who own uh, fishing vessels, and when I couldn't get onto a UNALS, or, which is our national research fleet, um, I would find a way to hop onto a fishing boat. And I can't help but wonder if there's opportunities for SOI and others to actually think about how do you use your resources to promote exploration without necessarily sending your beautiful ship and ROV there to begin with. Start with local exploration and build on that with a more substantial effort. So thanks for the question. Chris, did you have something? Yeah, I just. I, I'm passionate about exploration and finding new things. And I, I think of using these molecular approaches, we're finding out that, that life is distributed in, in incredible, it's incredibly heterogeneous. Like everywhere you look, you find new things. And the turnover is incredible. So even shallow reefs, we think we know, but there's not a lot of shared species when you drill down into that. So I, I think that there are places that are hard to access, that are very fun. There's a lot to discover everywhere, even in your own backyards if you take the time to stop looking and look and, and do it. Um, deep twilight zone, mesophotic, beyond scuba depths, the hard substrates that are hard to access, ROVs, environmental, you know, d deployed sampling devices and all that, that's super rich and really, really unknown. Um, I like that. So. If I could just add one thing more from the policy side, so less on the exploration, but thinking about what you were saying, what questions are we asking during exploration? And I think that's where policy levers can come into play. And uh, we had a presentation during an event in Washington last year at, a, um, at the Seattle Aquarium with West Coast legislators. And so someone from Department of Ecology was talking about how their ocean acidification monitoring has changed a lot and how they're testing for different things now because they've learned. And so they're really trying to change the whole rules of what they're doing. So even in the same areas, thinking about the different data inputs. And then I think that also gets to what Angela was saying about as we think about governments working more closely with tribal communities, tribal nations, and thinking about how do you ask questions that are relevant to thinking about traditional ecological knowledge and some of that that can feed back into those, um, into those economies and ecosystems and cultures. Uh, so I think that's where some of these policy directives that can be the, you know, at, the at the state level can then guide what agencies are doing and where funding is going. And so some of that I think is really important where legislators don't always know what questions to ask, but getting that informed from folks in this room can then like get that from the top, so it's being pushed down and saying, this is what needs to be prioritized with the money we're giving. Um, hi, uh, thank you, Jason Donofrio. I'm with the Ocean Foundation. Um, my question is really about, you know, something, this is for anyone on the panel, but Angelo, you, you really made me think of this, like, where is the disconnect between the historic levels, or what we keep hearing are the historic levels of funding, both from the federal government as well as philanthropy, and then the reality on the ground. Uh, there does seem to be this massive disconnect. You hear, we hear a lot of debt for nature swaps and blue bonds and all of these kind of financial schemes, but local communities seem to have less resources than ever, so something isn't quite matching up. And then you mentioned, you know, 50% of our own MPAs don't even have a management plan, and yet we hear, you know, we have funders in the room today like Bezos who say we're all in on 30 by 30, but if they're just paper parks and there's no management plan, then what's the point? And so where is the disconnect between historic levels of funding and yet we still don't have management plans for even areas we've already designated important enough to protect? You said my name, so I'll go yeah. Yeah. first. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, the second part, I, I think, is a lot of the funders have just priori prioritized designations, um, and you know, I, I think it, they come from they have a weird Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic worldview. Weird, weird. Um, and the the assumption for like ten years was, oh well, we designated something, the government's going to do it. Um, and like for the most part, like when it comes to NOAA, like for the most part, you do. Um, and it works really well in Hawaii, um, but it doesn't work well in the territories because of the human dimensions of the territories. And it just, it, it, it caught everybody in Hawaii off guard. The people in the territories are pissed off. Um, and they, like that, that's kind of how that happened. Um, you know, ocean conservation is just learning what forest conservation learned 30, 40 years ago. You know, there are, there are studies out there that show uh, there are funds designated just for indigenous people where 3% of the money goes to indigenous people and 97% of it gets sucked up by government and, and middlemen. So uh, 
I, I, that's, no one has the right answer for that, but it is, there's low capacity to handle money in a lot of these communities, and not only that, um, I'll use an example for somebody in the room. Um, I was doing a contract for somebody in Guam who's in this, well shit, she's, hey, it's Carlotta. Um, <laughs> Um, and the organization I worked for wanted like a million dollar insurance policy to, to give her like a small contract. And like she went, she went to the, the insurance company in Guam. They're like, what? <laughs> we, we're, we're not going to write that. Um, and so there's a, a disconnect at all levels um, from like what the lawyers require to you know, having the, the understanding of finance and... Uh, corruption is also a huge issue. It's really easy to steal money in the developing world. Um, and uh, I'm just mumbling right now, uh, but it, it, it's a lot of issues and nobody has figured it out yet. I would just add match requirements are another big one. I know that's something where philanthropic institutions have done a good job of stepping in, but many times some of these funding things, especially with the IRA even, there's a match requirement at the local level. We see that in the mainland US. I think that I imagine that's very true in a lot of territories as well. And you know, if you can't get the money locally, then it becomes really hard. And so trying to create innovative bonding mechanisms, Maryland has something called resilience authorities to try and access money more effectively. Um, there's some of the federal coastal resilience dollars did not require a match, which I know a lot of people People, probably some in this room fought for really hard, which was really innovative. And so trying to think about that match, either offsetting or removing is key. We got, we got the, <clears throat> excuse me, we got the three minute warning. So I'm gonna go five minute warning. I don't know what that is, five, three. Minutes. Six okay. and a half. <laughs> All right, question right here. Yeah, I'll be as quick as possible. All right, so hey, I'm Dr. Tierra Moore, uh, founder and CEO of Black and Marine Science. And one of the projects we're working on right now is literally called Bringing eDNA to the Streets. I wrote the grant myself. <laughs> and the whole goal is to really make this innovative technology that you're talking about more accessible. So I guess my question is, as you're thinking about these strategies and bringing all these people into the room, how are we thinking about community engagement and community science? We're thinking about that. And then also something else that we're doing with this project is we're partnering with this organization called Blacks of the Chesapeake, which is a whole group of just fishermen and women who have literally uh, measured the biodiversity of the Chesapeake Bay forever. And so again, how do we utilize these stories in this engagement strategy as well so we can really see like, is the eDNA telling us what actually was there, has been there, and use this as this historical museum as well? So that's my double two-part question. Go ahead, Pete. Take, go yeah, sure. It's great to see you, and great question. So just to, I'll keep this brief. I think that one of the things that um, I try and do, uh, being a faculty member at a very elite institution, uh, is to reach out to communities and say, you all have something to offer, and you have a perspective that I don't have. Right? If you live in the Chesapeake Bay, you know the Chesapeake better than I do. And I think starting by saying, okay, let's, let's hear what you know, I hear what I know, and really working hard to remind people that what they have to say is just as important as what I have to say. So for me, I think we start by acknowledging and uh, recognizing the value that everyone brings to the table. And then the question, I think, is how do you uh, empower people uh, not just to uh, use a tool you put on the table, but to innovate and adapt. And every time I go to other parts of the world, one of the coolest things is to see a technology of sorts that I've never seen before. And it isn't always whiz-bang whiz circuit boards and fancy new widgets, but it's often a solution to a problem that we don't have. And I think that really bolstering that sense of, of, of you know, you, you have something valuable to offer is a start. Now, you may have a more technical aspect. I'll turn to my colleague here, but I, I think that's really important to do. No, oh, Tiara, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I think the answer that the scaling this is the community, you know, they're, they're passionate, they want to tell their story. It's, it's their narrative. They know where they want to sample. Um, people are passionate, river, river keepers, anglers. They already have a narrative and a story to tell. It's just painting with a different canvas, right? And so being able to put the tool in people's hands, there is still cost issues with doing this technology that's not, not to be you know, uh, forgotten about. There, so it's going to require philanthropic investment. Or you're going to have to build uh, uh, innovation ways to drive those costs down. But again, like, sampling is just getting cheaper and cheaper. Moore's law, it's faster than Moore's law. Uh, it's, it's the access to the spaces and the questions and the people that is an incompressible cost and leveraging the passions and enthusiasm so they become 
shareholders and stakeholders, shareholders of the information themselves, and they can see themselves reflected in that information and be painting a more richer canvas uh, is really important. Could I just add, I mean, we've all heard um, data isn't used, isn't, that isn't used isn't useful data, but I think when Dr. Lipchenko talked about not just the science, but how does it deliver for people, um, I, that's something that we at NOAA and, and uh, Sarah Kapnick and others I think we're thinking about with all these new technologies is how do people have access to them. Um, but that's a conversation that needs to really happen in a deeper level and would welcome that. I know it's something the Science um, Advisory Board and others have been talking about. Um, and, and I'm so glad you brought it up. Excellent. Okay, we have one minute left. I'm gonna ask each of you to tell me something, one thing, process something that you, you are most excited about, something new in innovation. So we got five people here, you each get 20 seconds and I will cut you off. Okay, ready? Angelo, we're gonna go first. Strategy. <laughs> I'm really excited about the ocean justice strategy um, and, and how that plays out. Excellent. Uh, big data, machine learning. Goodness, the first thing that came to mind is just use of satellite information to better understand um, what's going on in the ocean. For tracking or for? Uh, well, we've been talking with uh, NESDIS and about, it from a variety, from looking at harmful algal blooms to tracking whales and um, using it to better tailor our management and conservation. Excellent. Pete? Working with uh, my colleagues at South Pacific Island Nations uh, to identify uh, ways in which they have something to offer that United States, that U.S. scientists don't have, and using that as as a, a, a hook towards building more genuine collaborations. Massachusetts has a Blue Communities Bill proposed that would add financial incentives for communities to actually act on ocean acidification recommendations developed by scientists, as well as nutrient reduction inputs. So it's actually adding a carrot um, as well as sticks. Great. All right. Thank you all very much, and thank you, audience. took to heart requests from several of the participants that we really needed to build in time for discussion. And so we tried to do a little bit of that around the panels. But now we have a 15 minute free for all. <laughs> Go. OK, so what we'd like to do is invite um, anyone to think about what we've talked about from the beginning of this event through all of these conversations on the stage. Um, and are there key points that we didn't get to that we really need to? Um, are there things that we, you didn't hear enough about that we should be talking about more in more depth? Um, you know, what would you like to reflect on? What would you like us to maybe plan a future conversation around? Um, anything's, anything's good we want to hear? Go. Free for all. Moderated, however, uh, but but yes. So questions of, of any kind are open, and we would like this to be a discussion. So we're very happy for people to to um, offer to answer someone else's question. We obviously are not going to be answering them all. Um, so um, go for it, Carlotta, and then Chris. Um, the question um, that I have that I would like to see more attention paid to, and Chris uh, brought it up in a discussion when we were just sitting here talking, is ownership over the knowledge that's coming out from the exploration. And so what are they finding in the trench? Uh, what are they finding when they go out there? And then I am very interested in helping create the laws for the Pacific peoples to capitalize on that. So that's something that I think needs to be explored. So ownership and the legal way of making sure that that is available. Anyone want to take that? Do we have working microphones here? Oh, there, no, it's working. It's on. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I, no, I don't have an answer, but I do know that uh, this is a, a, a growing uh, concern and I think an important uh, topic of discussion. And so uh, m many entities, uh, including federal agencies, have really pushed for full open access of all the data. And I think that there, I am, I'm learning, I'm still in the process of learning that, that this may be at odds uh, with what some other entities uh, or uh, individuals or communities or other nations want. And I think that, that we would uh, be well served to, to have a conversation about how we treat ownership of data and how we also think about interpretation of data. Because I think that w right now there is this, I think, almost sense that if you just make everything open, it'll b all be okay. And, and I can understand that. But I think how those data are used and interpreted is a separate conversation and one that we just haven't had enough of. So thank you. Chris? Thank you. Hi, Chris Seri. Um, first of all, I want to say a huge thank you to all of the panelists. And one of the things I would love if there's ever a chance for them to follow up on is Jane mentioned the biodiversity strategy that the federal agencies are working on. And I think it is so important that strategy is rooted in what users need as far as their information and services. So I would love for all the panelists that are different variety of users to be able to say, this is what we need in strategy, this is what we need in an implementation plan so that we have the right data and services. And then also feed into that, how is indigenous knowledge and wisdom going to become part of that data strategy because that's really something very difficult from the, the federal government. I think that actually helps get at some of the ownership issues too, right? Because that is then data that is owned by everyone so they see themselves as part of that service. So that would just be my, my follow-up. Thanks, Chris. Just a brief follow-up to that. Um, <clears throat> this section is about moving into a discussion of partnerships and the actions that will come next. Um, uh, Ellen and Jane both uh, exhorted us early, earlier to, to action. And one of the actions that you can take right now is to offer your thoughts for that national biodiversity, uh, ocean biodiversity strategy. Uh, we should probably have a QR code here so you can put your phone on it. But if you Google national ocean biodiversity strategy request for information, um, you will find it. Uh, it's in the Federal Register. NSF is running it. Thank you, NSF. Karen, I, yeah. Thank you. Um, so one of the themes that kept coming up in different panels was the conversation around food security. And I just wonder how much there is room in conversation that needs to happen in the future. Um, as someone who used to be in the food policy sector, I can tell you these conversations don't happen, but yet it feels like we're not having a full conversation without there not only being cross-sectoral um, approaches, but also across like even different policy or specialty areas because um, this is something that I think the food policy or just food sector in general, those who are working towards SDG2 um, to end hunger, like there's, I don't know, it was just a theme that kept coming up and I wonder where there's opportunity to expand and lift up the conversation around food security more um, when it comes to ocean conservation. Are there participants who can speak to that? I see a hand. Oh, is that Tuck? Um, no. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Tuck Hines. I'm the director of the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, about 25 miles uh, east of here. Um, I, I guess I don't know if I can answer that question, but I wanted to comment on some things that I thought were missing in the conversation today. Um, one, one is a question that I've had is how, how do we mobilize the economic power that everybody says is so important uh, to do good things? Um, nobody's commented on the fact that uh, ins uh, insurance companies are no longer funding policies in the whole state of California or the whole state of Florida. Um, that's a pretty strong regulatory impact uh, as a stick, you know, for paying attention to climate change, whether you think the science is important or not, the economy sure does. The other is the other side of things of, of uh, incentives that are working and creating innovation. One of those is the, the idea of uh, creating or using uh, nature-based solutions 
for restoring and building uh, biodiverse friendly shorelines that are being impacted by sea level rise and storm surges uh, all over the country now. Um, so those are sort of two examples of, of, uh, of sort of carrot and stick regulatory and incentive uh, kinds of things that are going on that we haven't commented on, but they're in, uh, in some ways positive, uh, positive uh, effects of change or forces for change. And, and the last one was, uh, was uh, technology. Um, we talked about tracking uh, and telemetry, uh, it, genomics, everything else, for understanding how much in the oceans are moving. They're, m most of the nearshore species have migratory life cycles, and we know almost nothing about them. Chesapeake Bay has something like 230 common species of fish. 200 of them are migratory in some form of their life cycle, and we only know about 10 of those migratory life cycles. So the technology that we have now that could be applied to that is really valuable from a conservation and restoration. And then lastly, on the, on the incentive side of thing, technology, marine invasive species are a huge problem. Many of the problems that we see are a result of species coming in and impacting those things. And um, now technology over the last 30 years for shipping to uh, manage ballast water is actually working and we're bending the curve on invasions. And that's a big scale, multi-billion dollar industry to change how ships are managing ballast water and actually changing the rate of invasions coming into coastal systems. And the United States, along with Canada and New Zealand and Australia, have led that. So now the IMO is finally starting to spread that on a global scale um, that really has some uh, hope for um, biodiversity around the whole, all of the seas. So those are things that have been left out uh, in this conversation, in my mind, and that we ought to be looking to as examples of how we can do, can do things, but how they ought to be extended further to really have impact. Yes, Lieutenant Governor Josh. Uh, one of the biggest issues I think uh, that uh, is a very violent issue, I would say, is uh, this whole uh, issue of the uh, undersea uh, mining. And I think it's very, uh, everybody should be very uh, conscious about uh, a, uh, a big case that uh, Vanuatu, the island nation, has filed in the International Court of Justice uh, challenging this. And when um, the White House director was talking about, or it may have been one of the senior executive branch folks that are here talking about uh, comparing what they're doing with Canada and elsewhere, you know, there's the government side, but it's also uh, you need to be very aware what your private sector actors are doing. You know, in the Vanuatu situation, it's a Canadian exploration company that's doing um, the stuff um, out there. So being very conscious of what the private sector is doing especially in this area, I think is uh, crucial to the conversation. Thank you. Joe. Hey, uh, Gabrielle, Joe Wheeler, and the CEO of a company called Blue Movement. Um, you know, Ray Dalio made this comment at COP28 uh, when he was talking about, you know, the money it's gonna take to uh, address climate change and um, as we know, kind of the real money is with institutional investors. You know, $200 trillion, which he made a comment that only 0.3% of those dollars are invested in ecological projects. So I guess a request I would say at the, if there's another meeting is that we need to bring those people in the room. You know what I mean? It's like, it would be great to have like a money manager from Fidelity or Vanguard or the people that really own those $200 trillion to understand what do they need from this group to come to the table with real dollars. So that's just a request, I think, because if we can't change the mix of the capital stack that brings public and private funding, many of you read the 2023 report that you know only like $200 billion has gone into biodiversity, 86% of this was from public funding. Like we just have to change the mix and I think it'd be great to have them here uh, versus later, just a comment. Thank you. I see a hand. Just one point before we go on. I, I think that brings us back to some of the discussion that happened earlier on about the narrative. You know, how do we, how do we frame that narrative so that it gets those people in the room and, and makes it clear how important that is? I, I agree with you. Um, 
I, I am those people. <laughs> um, so I'm just in awe of, I sat and learned a lot today. So uh, I'm a manager at T. Rowe Price. Uh, we manage about $1.4 trillion in our European client book, very forward thinking on this. We need to get the American client book, particularly that's the long dated pension money. You, you are the pensioners. So if you requested 1% of your assets, to have a long-term focus with these outcomes, it happens, and that's tens and hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, I can be a resource, happy to connect with folks, but we're already working on this in partnership with the World Bank on Blue Finance, but there needs to be a lot more. Thanks. We've got time. Uh, oh, no, we don't have time for anything. Mosh is saying stop. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we, we'll continue this conversation um, at, at the reception, uh, so much to talk about. Oh, no, I know we have something else to do. I'm just saying uh, that that will happen later. I'm sorry if I implied that we're finished. Um, we, we, uh, we talked about the transition from the wonderful voices that we've heard from every direction into action. And what we'd like to do now is summarize just a few uh, actions that are underway now. Um, and, part, and particularly partnerships uh, among some of the folks uh, in the room. Well, we, um, so we have some, okay, yeah. I'll just turn it over to you. Go the real vision at work. Um, okay, so Emma just said, a priority for all of us involved in this summit has been on action. And I think we're really considering what do we take forward from this event? Um, it'll be really interesting to learn what some of the conversations are that you all have at the reception. Um, any tidbits that you want to share with us after this evening, please do. Um, ideas for next conversations. Um, Ideas, if any of you are interested in convening those next conversations, I think you have w uh, willing partners in this room, is what I'm hearing over the course of the day. So there are, of course, a lot of exciting activities that are underway to conserve ocean biodiversity, to think about how we're better um, incorporating different types of knowledge into decision making. Um, but we wanted to just highlight a few that show how partners coming together can move the ball on these things, um, providing knowledge and data, um, informing how we interact with biodiversity and what it does for us. Um, so we stand the best chance that, you know, of protecting it for, for nature's sake. So um, I think I'd, li I'd li just like to transition maybe right into a series of announcements, um, but just to say, also after this summit, we do plan to keep up momentum um, through the Ocean Sciences meeting, which some of you will attend, I'm sure. Uh, we have a town hall meeting planned for that uh, conference that will focus in more detail on the National Ocean Biodiversity Strategy. Um, we're looking forward to Capitol Ocean Hill Week, uh, Capitol Hill Ocean Week in June. Um, and there are so many events beyond that that several of you have mentioned over the course of the day. So lots of exciting opportunity to coordinate among government agencies, but well beyond the federal circle um, to engage you know, many of you in this room and your colleagues and those you suggest we bring to the table. Um, so let's turn to your iPad that I just turned off. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not to worry. Yes, so our first, uh, first partnership is very close to home uh, between the Smithsonian and uh, NOAA, National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, Smithsonian and NOAA leadership have been uh, working together and talking about working together more for, for some time. Uh, many of you know the National Marine Fisheries Service Systematics Lab has been based right here in this museum for, for quite a number of years. Um, the uh, Smithsonian's Marine Geo Network that is studying coastal science around the world has been working closely with the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network that is uh, that uh, Gabrielle is a uh, manager of. Um, in the past weeks, uh, Smithsonian NOAA staff and legal teams have made a 
uh, heroic effort, I th can say, to ensure a new memorandum of understanding at the highest level uh, with, with, uh, between these two agencies. And so um, we'd like to, first of all, thank the teams who made that possible, uh, and also thank you to uh, Dr. Ellen Stofen and uh, Dr. Sarah Kapnick um, for joining us to celebrate the signing uh, of this historic agreement. Um, so would you like to join us up here? Ellen and Sarah, please. Um, I'll just move over here. I'm going to pop off. OK. All right. We'll just turn it over to you at this stage. OK. It's tight up here. Excellent. I think Sarah was supposed to go first. It's OK. Yeah, we're we're at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, the long-standing relationship between Smithsonian and NOAA includes many different things. Uh, the NOAA National Systematics Laboratory, staffed by NOAA museum scientists and located here in the museum for more than 50 years, has developed one of the largest and most important collections of fish and invertebrates around the world. Number two, we've had development of Natural History Museum's Sant Ocean Hall, the permanent exhibit that receives more than three million visitors a year. It opened in 2008 with an overarching message that the ocean is diverse and a global system essential to all life, including all of you, um, including yours. That message is further shared through the Smithsonian's public programming, school programs, and the Ocean Portal website. NOAA also supports all of these efforts via in-kind support and funding for select school programs. We've also established synergistic biodiversity observing and data sharing efforts through the Global Marine Biodiversity Observation Network in the Marine Global Earth Observatory. And more recently, we've also shared leadership in pushing forward a national strategy on ocean biodiversity. By formalizing our coordination around research and education, this MOU capitalizes on our organization's combined strengths to help partners and communities better understand biodiversity and the life our shared ocean, so we can take together action to address the risks facing ocean ecosystems. Our ocean and the life it contains underpin and are critical to the environmental and economic health of communities and of people nationwide. The commitment that we are put forward today embodies in this MOU the rich partnership between Smithsonian and NOAA and will advance the priorities we've been discussing here at the summit to help conserve and restore biodiversity. Now, Ellen. <laughs> Thank you. We're really um, excited to take a historic step towards a more robust collaboration between the Smithsonian and NOAA. Understanding and stewarding the nation's precious ocean life and resources requires collaboration and a whole of society approach. Today's agreement represents a major step in that dire direction by joining two of the United States leading organizations in this realm. This agreement will strengthen and expand the wide-ranging uh, collaborative work that we do and identify new opportunities to advance our shared priorities, notably in biodiversity, science, blue carbon work, and education. And I will say, you know, the strength to me of this partnership has really been shown through the process of putting this summit uh, together. And we do have bigger rooms. Um, and the next time we come together, um, we will be in that bigger room because I have just been blown away by this convening capability that we've had to bring this group together. But to me, it's just shown how much more we can do, especially the bigger the rooms we use. So I'm on it. Um, so anyway, we're grateful to Administrator NOAA, uh, NOAA Administrator um, Dr. Rick Spinrad, our NOAA colleagues, um, and our whole Smithsonian team for making this possible, and we look forward to a bright new era for ocean science working together, and especially to bringing everything that people in this room are doing um, to the public. So thank you. Thank you. So I think what I'd like to do for the next few announcements um, is just invite the groups to, 
to the stage. It's a little tight up here. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> That's not what I meant. But invite the groups to the stage. So first, um, I'd like to welcome uh, a group that is going to speak about biodiversity data cooperation. We've heard a little bit about the um, importance of findable, accessible data. Um, and there are initiatives underway and very active conversations, not just in the federal circle, but with many of our non-federal colleagues about how to make this um, happen from a biodiversity perspective and how to fill critical gaps in the information that we need. Um, so I'd like to invite, and I, I would ask as we've been doing throughout the, thank you, doing throughout the day, um, as, as the speakers come up, however brief you're going to be, please just me introduce yourself. And um, so first on biodiversity data cooperation, I'd like to welcome David Applegate, Paul Schultz, Kirk Johnson, and Alex Eisern to this stage. Pile of crest. How are you, man? Good to see you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you make it through here? <laughs> that would not that would not be good. All right. Well, no. Well, well. Wonderful. We really appreciate this opportunity to to really reaffirm. Um, uh, a strong partnership um, in the in the data arena. So I'm Dave Applegate. I'm the director of the U.S. Geological Survey, um, and uh, we are very much committed to um, the importance of not just doing science, not just collecting data, but seeing that data put to work. And that is very much the case for for all of my colleagues here. Um, we've heard about the importance of data. Uh, we've heard about the need for having access to data. Data is not something that uh, thrives in isolation, right? We, the, the, the value of it and the ability to put it towards decisions is all about that ability to, to, to be able to assemble it and pull it together. Um, and so really what we wanted to, to just speak about briefly here is a longstanding commitment um, uh, to the ocean um, biodiversity information system um, as well as the global um, ocean biodiversity um, facility and uh, um, the U.S. nodes for that. And this is something that the, the USGS, uh, NOAA, NSF, and the Smithsonian um, have been engaged in for uh, over 20 years, um, really working on behalf of the broader National Science and Technology Council collaboration um, for the U.S., but then more broadly, um, this is part of a global effort um, overseen by the International Oceanographic Commission. Uh, we know that, uh, uh, that biologic uh, observations are absolutely foundational uh, for the ability to then uh, to understand the, the state of the oceans, to understand uh, not only the, uh, the, the creatures themselves, but all of that, that metadata, all of that additional information that needs to be assembled. We've heard about some of the exciting opportunities now, things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to be able to bring all of that together. Um, but it doesn't just happen. And so the goal of the OBIS system is to be able uh, to um, provide the, the bioinformatics, to provide the standards, all of the different uh, sort of uh, efforts that have to go into being able to truly um, uh, put this information to work. So anyway, we just really wanted to, again, reaffirm that commitment. And um, so I'll, I do that on behalf of the USGS, and I'm going to turn it over to, to Paul Schultz next uh, for, uh, for NOAA. We'll see, if we can. we'll see if we can do this dance without anybody falling off the stage. Yeah. I did have 10 pages of notes, but I think I'll keep it to a few comments. <laughs> My name is Paul Schultz. I'm the Deputy Assistant Administrator for the National Ocean Service. And we are proud. I'm pl proud and honored to be here and to be able to celebrate how far we have come in the 20 years working on this project doesn't necessarily mean that we're done or that we've got it all done, but we've made significant progress. Specifically in three areas, we've actually advanced a community of practice, which is focused on how we share data, access the, the same data, and share it in a standardized way. Second, we're focused on educating people on how to use and apply that data. But equally important, working with the product and service and tool developers to understand the needs of the, and requirements of the communities that we're trying to serve this data to. 
so that they're not just necessarily pushing data out there, but they're understanding how they're going to be the data is going to be used for information and decision making. This has included at least four specific programs within NOAA. I'm not going to name them because I could bury you in acronyms, um, as well as many programs across these offices, and we would like to continue to expand the partnership as we go forward. So we're proud to be part of this, and we look forward to continuing partnership. Yeah. Kirk Johnson, right here, Natural History. Um, if you think about it, all of marine biodiversity is pegged back to original voucher specimens that are held in scientific collections around the world. And there are probably 6,000 uh, to 7,000 at least scientific collections around the world. They all operate as in independent, distinct entities. They're like an archipelago of little museums. So all of the collections and all of the museums represent what humanity knows about the marine biodiversity of the planet. Less, uh, over the last eight years, we've been working with the largest museums in the world. And in, in March, we published a paper in Science with 73 of the world's largest museums that basically described their collection contents in advance of digitizing them and sort of defined where about 1.1 billion objects are located. And now we're working closely with uh, GBIF, the Global uh, Biodiversity in Information Facility in Copenhagen, which is also mentioned by David Applegate about um, our U.S. partnership there, to make a systematic map of all of the institutions in North America, the 26 countries and the 24 uh, other governmental entities that make up North America, including Caribbean and Central America, Canada and Greenland, to get a handle on where those collections actually are. There is no such list right now, believe it or not. You can't actually put your finger on a button and see all those things. And so we're working with GBIF and a thing called GR Cycle, which is a Smithsonian interagency working group uh, product that strove to build the list of all of the scientific collections in the world. We're going to sort of boil that down. Now. So it's an ongoing pop, uh, sort of a, a, attempt to build a global network of collections and then digitize those collections and make them sort of the anchoring information for all the work that needs to be done on future work on marine biodiversity. This stage is truly narrow. Um, <laughs> so I would just like from the National Science Foundation to say um, thank you first, mm -hmm. Kirk, for in for having us at this wonderful, wonderful venue. Um, I love coming to meetings here. Um, and um, th we really value this partnership. Uh, we feel that, uh, of course, as we've heard today, and I think we all know that in order to understand biodiversity, we have to have data to understand changes and, and to be able to understand what those changes mean. And at NSF, we've been investing not only in the the data collection through long-term ecological research sites, which occupy a number of different environments, and really have for so many years been such a jewel in our crown because it allows researchers to collect data over time periods much longer than a normal grant. Um, we've also invested in observing networks such as Ocean Observatories Initiative, the National Ecological Observation <laughs> Network, NEON, um, that really allow a much broader temporal and spatial scale for collecting observations that are connected to biodiversity. That, that data then goes into the databases. But importantly, we've also really been investing in technologies, not only in instrumentation to do observations, but technologies in how to analyze observations. So AI um, and other tools, um, machine learning, but importantly, without people, you can have all the data you want, and it's just numbers and, and zeros and ones. And we're investing in people and that next generation workforce that understands big data, that knows how to, how to work with data sets, how to use the tools that computer scientists are inventing to help us get more out of our observations. We're also putting a lot of effort in diversifying that workforce. We know we need everybody at the table, and we also, the importance of the fact this isn't a national problem, it's a global problem. So really connecting globally and really investing in people globally because that's really how we're going to make advances and do more with what we have and also do more and just do more. So thank you very much. I can't jump like right. you did. <laughs> <laughs> Lead us off. <laughs> So 
Thank you so much. So I'd like to now ask um, a group to come to the stage, a partnership I'm proud to be part of, um, to talk about a US, ocean, um, a U.S. ocean biodiversity assessment and a recent um, publication and series of projects um, that are very exciting. Charlotte Hudson, Sean Cosgrove, and Chris Seri. Good evening, and I'll, uh, in the interest of time, I'll take the liberty of introducing my colleagues. My name is Charlotte Hudson, and I direct the Lenfest Ocean Program at the Pew Charitable Trust. I'm happy to be joined by my colleagues, Chris Seri, formerly the CEO and president of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, um, and now the managing director of Go Blue, and Sean Crossgrove, who you had the esteemed honor of hearing from earlier today of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Um, first, we just want to thank uh, the organizers of today, uh, the Smithsonian, NOAA, and all of the supporting in, uh, organizations. This has been a tremendous day, a long time in the planning, but also probably a short time in the planning for the organizers in terms of pulling it all together. It really has been a tremendous effort, and we can't tell you how excited we are uh, to be a part of it. Um, what we want to share with you today is actually echoing and I'm not at all surprised to say this, echoing comments that we heard, frankly, from the opening speakers today, all the way through the last series of announcements, um, which is, how do we all come together to make marine biodiversity operational? How do we work in communities to understand what their needs are and what their questions are about the ocean environments they're managing? And how do we make the information that you all and many others around the world are collecting through observing and monitoring how do we make that useful to people on the ground? And so the three of us uh, in 2020 embarked on an ambitious study. Really, this is all Chris's fault. This was entirely her idea. Um, and we uh, joined together to support an ambitious project to develop a scientific method to assess the distribution and assessment of marine biodiversity in US waters, both inside and outside of currently protected areas. And then we wanted to apply what we, that framework and that knowledge um, to US waters to understand what biodiversity was in protected areas, what types of habitats were currently under protection, and frankly, what was missing. We've heard a lot today about where those protected areas are, how we're getting, to, how we're getting from 26% to 30%. Well, what kinds of habitats do those entail? Does it, is it representative of, what we of the kinds of habitats we have in the United States? So this work, not surprisingly, has been led by Emmett Duffy here, as you well know, his colleague Daniel Dunn at the University of Queensland, and Dr. S Sarah Janot Wolfson at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. And they recently have published this framework in One Earth. It came out this month. Um, and it actually outlines a way for managers and communities to ground the decisions they're making about their marine environments with knowledge of what the marine biodiversity distribution is in their areas. Um, not surprisingly then, we were a lot of questions about, well, can't we actually apply this to some areas in the United States? So we went back to our um, respective institutions and in partnership with the Paul M. Angel Family Foundation who provided additional support, we now have supported a second task force along these lines. Um, and this time we were very happy to have Gabrielle join Emmett in this effort, along with another colleague of theirs from the University of South Alabama, Dr. Stephen Cyphers. So this next expert group, which is underway now, not only do they pull off these kinds of convenings, they are also running task forces uh, and many other things at the same time. Um, it is actually going to operationalize this framework that came out in One Earth in three different communities. Um, the Gulf of Mexico, Chesapeake Bay, and the Salish Sea, uh, which for those of you um, who are from the East Coast is off the coast of the state of Washington in British Columbia. And I will say, Dr. Moore, if, if you are still in the room, your, your comment about Chesapeake Bay, I'm sure they're gonna wanna connect with you, so I've, I was listening and I very much appreciate that. Um, all of this information, obviously there's much more detail here, can be found on the lenfestocean.org website. The papers there, some summary materials, some maps, um, a lot of other information, and I'm going to hand it uh, to Sean for a quick moment. So this is very exciting work. Um, both of these efforts are intended to provide examples of how marine biodiversity information can be used to make 
good on existing commitments and legal mandates. Okay, the examples here, such as implementing the President's commitment to protect 30% of land and waters by 2030, the White House Ocean Climate Action Plan, and the National Ocean Biodiversity Strategy that you've heard about today. Informing existing mandates that involve area-based management from the National Marine Sanctuaries Act to the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act, and linking climate resilience and biodiversity by incorporating improved future species distributions to help foster climate resilient fisheries and climate informed habitat conservation and restoration. So here's your part. The challenge to this audience is this. From the wealth of information we've heard today, what steps do we need to take to operationalize the use of marine biodiversity information in decision making in your sector? What needs to be included in the national strategy for ocean biodiversity stewardship to make it useful to practitioners on the ground? We need a pathway to operationalize the use of marine biodiversity information. It will involve collaboration across sectors, including government, indigenous communities, scientists, NGOs, and ocean industries. But it is imperative to effectively conserve key components of marine biodiversity and sustain healthy ocean ecosystems. Thank you all so much. It's been great to be here today. And um, we look forward to talking later on at the reception. Okay, thanks. Um, and I would like to invite Joel Johnson back to the stage um, to speak about Capitol Hill Ocean Week and next steps there for leadership on ocean biodiversity. Okay, I'll make this short because uh, it's getting to that witching hour when eyes are glazing over and cocktails seem uh, imminent. Um, first, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to the Smithsonian uh, for hosting us today, as usual. Um, just absolutely incredible space, inspiring. Um, and just make a note that I think about 40 years ago, right around the same time, um, one of my mentors, E.O. Wilson, was um, just down the hall, I think, talking about national biodiversity. And so, uh, along with Tom Lovejoy, who are both uh, dearly missed. Um, I also want to say thank you, of course, to NOAA uh, for their close collaboration and partnership with the Smithsonian and the team behind uh, not only this event, but the creation of this incredible opportunity, frankly, a, a, a movement, if you will, to create a national ocean strategy, biodiversity strategy. Um, also want to thank the other sponsors who were a part of making today possible uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute and IOS. Um, couldn't have done that without you all, so thank you all for pitching in. So Capitol Hill Ocean Week, we are going to be um, having a theme this year. As you know, Capitol Hill Ocean Week happens every year in June um, around leadership. And I want to invite each and every one of you, and including the audience who have been tuning in all day, um, enwrapped by this co uh, conversation around a biodiversity strategy, to consider joining us here in Washington, D.C., uh, June 4th, 5th, and 6th for Capitol Hill Ocean Week, which I believe will be in its 22nd year. And in fact, we actually have two, um, two folks here who have been working on Capitol Hill Ocean Week for many years, including someone who was around when it just began. Um, it has always been this nation's premier Ocean and Great Lakes Conference where you and your colleagues can get together and build new networks, create new relationships, tell the story of your projects, your communities, and ensure that 
Washington, D.C. is listening. Along with Capitol Hill Ocean Week, there are a number of different events that include Capitol Hill Day, where we will go up to the Hill and rally around the most important issues of our time um, and ensure that we are creating movement on those big things like 30 by 30 and creating an opportunity to carry the water today. The importance of what you learn today about biodiversity and the critical nature of developing this strategy. That same day, uh, which is, will, will be the fourth, later on that evening we will have the Ocean Awards Gala. The Ocean Awards Gala every year um, honors those change makers, those wave makers who are making a difference, not only in the National Marine Sanctuaries, um, but also against um, the, the, the systemic inequities, um, working on stemming the loss of biodiversity, uh, and frankly, you know, creating some of the, the, the strongest um, legislation and um, action to create climate resiliency, which we all desperately need. Followed by two incredible days of conferences, the 5th and the 6th of June. Um, as you heard earlier, there's going to be a number of side events uh, that typically get planned around Capitol Hill Ocean Week. And we at the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation are proud to share that we will be creating a platform and an opportunity um, for the leaders of this task force to come back together and convene on the subject of the biodiversity uh, strategy. Hopefully by then there will be some tremendous momentum potentially some announcements, um, and we can pop some bubbly uh, together. So I just encourage you to go to marinesanctuary.org, marinesanctuary.org, to learn how you can participate in Capitol Hill Ocean Week. Um, we would love to have you. And of course, we'll be around for the rest of the evening. Myself, my colleagues, Shannon Colbert there, and TJ Tate are happy to talk to you further. And then lastly, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, Dr. Emmett Duffy and Gabriel for your leadership, um, which is something that we will be celebrating at Child this week, for your leadership on this important work. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that the seeds you've planted with this very diverse crowd today and this very diverse audience um, are going to bear fruit that none of us can begin to imagine. Um, and so thank you. So we are now at closing remarks, <laughs> as then you guys will be get, getting up. Um, so as we conclude this summit, I wanted to give a few reflections on this conversation. As Andrew Steer noted in his remarks, in 1992, we didn't seize the opportunity because we lacked the information, inclusive engagement, and economic case for action on biodiversity. 30 years later, we cannot miss this moment. The challenge we will be translating the energy and ideas and collaborations we've heard about today into real action that protects ocean life and the people who depend on it, which is all of us. Today we heard not just a conversation about inspiration, but also about systematic issues and hard choices that we face as a global community. We need more champions that bring their experiences and stories to finding solutions, embracing not just the traditional use case for biodiversity, but also really transforming how we think about the value. This includes a more holistic approach that acknowledges the intrinsic dimensions of these resources, including the cultural and spiritual, but also the practical dimensions of price. To return to the challenge that Ellen gave us at the very beginning, we must move beyond rhetoric to action. Ideas are only as good as the action that they inspire. There's been so much inspiration here today, but I want us to think about where we want to be in six months, where we want to be in a year, and what we hope to say we've achieved in this decisive decade. The time is now. The US is developing a national strategy for ocean biodiversity that will serve as an impetus for action. Although not, federal, although not federal register notices 
are not the most exciting action, it is important nonetheless. And so I reiterate this call to all of you to share your thoughts on what this national strategy should include through the public request for information that is a step, but not the only step, for engaging and shaping the future of ocean biodiversity. That is one, but not the only one way um, we can ensure that the strategy is user driven. This event is really a kickoff to a year of activities that are intended to catalyze action for ocean biodiversity that will include informing engagement in our oceans conference that takes place in March, Capitol Hill Ocean Week in June, and the International Marine Conservation Conference and the next biodiversity COP, which will both be in October. It will be a busy but very exciting year of action to establish better protections, more equitable protections, more strategic protection of our ocean's life, but also working with communities that live in those, with those species and ecosystems. If we all carry a unified message and make it resonate with governments, funders, and those active in conservation on the ground and water, we can advance real progress towards a more vibrant ocean life and ecosystems. Before we conclude, we really need to acknowledge all the hard work and dedication of the people and groups that have made this summit possible. A big thank you to Gabrielle Canonico and Noah, of NOAA and Emmett Duffy of the Smithsonian for leading this tremendous effort that brought us here. Thank you so much. We also need to thank Katie and Masha from UCAR Center for Ocean Leadership and to Caitlin from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center for all the detailed work that brought us all together um, and for ensuring this event is live and on the web to Amy. And importantly, thank you to all of our sponsors from the IUS Association, the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, and Schmidt Ocean Institute. <laughs> Last. Thank you to all of you here in this room who traveled here for today and for your leadership in joining us to make this event a success. I thank all of you and all the people that also are online that have joined in, and I look forward to working with you and to continuing this discussion now, and especially at the reception as we move into that space to be able to continue these dialogues that will start at 6.30. Back to you, Emmett and Gabriel, for the final instructions. So cocktails and food, I think, at 6.30, though. The reception starts um, at 6.30. It gives the museum staff and the caterers time to set up. The museum is just closing at 5.30. So what we'd ask is that you kind of mingle here. Restrooms are out in the hall. And we'll head over to the Sant Ocean Hall at 6.25. Um, there will be a few of us hanging around the doors to guide you if you don't know your way. Um, and, and that's, that's our transition to the fun part of today. <laughs> the other fun part of today. The other fun part of so today. So yeah, you have a little bit of time to check your emails, do whatever needs to be done before 6.30 will we'll go up. Thanks, everyone.